Coming to you live from deep in the heart of Minnesota. It is living the line. I'm Sean Robinson. How are you doing, Carson? I'm doing good. Thanks, Sean. Uh, I'm really excited. Uh, we have an awesome guest today. I think an artist that was pretty pretty formative uh, to, to where I went in my young 20s, the, the, the comics that he was working on, especially Promethea. And then you, like you started on Chase, Promethea desolation jones yeah. batman runs sandman and now you're doing your own book echo lands i mean you've just had a big big footprint on the industry and worked with a ton of ton of awesome writers so we're super yeah. excited about this and super super thankful that you're willing yeah. to take the time to talk to us appreciate yeah. it Jay. welcome to the show thank you thanks for having you. me on uh, so we we wanted to just ask you because uh mm -hmm. both of us are uh really interested in peering inside of your brain uh sure. for a little bit if you you know let us get a little little view uh what do you have like any early memories of drawing or like your sort of formative memories of you know what the first yeah. experience was like for you yeah i mean <clears throat> i don't have any time in my life where i don't remember not drawing or you know what i mean or remember not drawing sorry that yeah. was a double negative <laughs> but um yeah i always i was always drawing doodling and stuff and my uh my mom would make a joke that you know, the first thing I picked up was a pencil. I don't know how true that is, but, you know, it was like this running joke in the house. And I always remember, the, the thing I remembered most distinctly trying to doodle when I was a kid was, you know, like Marvel superhero characters hmm. a lot. I, I have like these distinct memories of these, you know, trying to draw the Avengers or, you know, battling the Hulk or whatever, like these, uh, menagerie of things you know i don't know what happened to most of those drawings i wish i still had them just for like be interesting to see but there's yeah. a couple i have distinct memories of you know yeah at, at what, what point did you like did that turn into this is what i'm gonna do like like did you ever pronounce that like i, I think i yes. went to my parents around seven or eight and i said i'm gonna be a comic artist when i grew up uh, same thing same thing it was around the same age uh that's pretty interesting uh yeah to the detriment of you know my the fear of my parents <laughs> yeah and i did not give myself any other option that was that was the thing yeah. that drove them nuts the most uh so around eight or age eight to ten range is when i kind of made that decision and it was all because you know before i, I i'll try to make this as quick as possible but uh, when I would, I, growing up in the Bay Area, you, you come, come across comic books, right? They're just, they were everywhere yeah. in the grocery stores, 7-Elevens, all that kind of stuff. So I was exposed to comics really early and like any young kid loved reading them, but I didn't really think much about them. The only thing I really understood on some of them, uh, some of the ones I was teen to like the most, it would say Stanley Presents, Right. And, uh, and then, but also around that time, I was super obsessed with these toys called Micronauts. Mm, and I had yeah. like, you know, the Marvel Mego characters and GI Joes and Rom the Space Knight and Shogun Warriors and these kinds of things, uh, which I loved, but the, for whatever reason, the Micronauts, I went bonkers for, I don't know if it was because they were so strange, even though they were tiny, they were strange and science fictiony and all all the imagery to them was so imaginative and diverse. And then one day I walked into a 7-Eleven going through the comic spinner rack and came across Micronauts number one. Uh. And I was like, what? This just blew my mind. And I, I had a little bit, I had like $2 or whatever. And uh, so I bought the comic, was so excited over it because my obsession over these toys that I sat down on the stoop outside uh, in the parking lot and started to read it and was completely, my mind was blown because I hadn't really seen a comic like that before. Uh, Michael Golden's artwork was so yeah. different, oh, yeah. but dramatic and, and, and so imaginative. And, and then Bill Mantlow's writing was super interesting. And when I think back about those stories, how daring it was what he did as a writer about hey, I got this job to write this comic based on these toys, but he made this whole giant universe of 
to for these characters to live in and then write it in a way where you talk down about it he even though they were toys he kind of like no i'm going to do this really cool serious science fiction adventure thing and put load stuff in there that makes you think about things like uh, you know the number one thing that was like kind of shocking at the time was like the villain baron cards are having this thing called the body banks where he would repurpose people's bodies so to to create longevity i mean that's dark stuff for a kid a, a, a comic based on kids toys uh but the, the number one thing for me was because I was so obsessed and the artwork blew my mind and the writing was so interesting. It was the first time I really noticed the credits box, like really understood the credits box and seeing all those people who made this thing. That's when I go, oh, people make these things, right? Yeah. And it really dawned on me. Uh, and then at school, I was telling a friend, like, oh, you got to see this comic book, this amazing comic book called Micronauts. And they're like, oh, well, if you like that, you got to see Uncanny X-Men. And that was around the Claremont Cochrane Burn era. Yeah. They showed me that, and it was just as captivating to my young mind, but dramatically different than the Micronauts. But I felt it's equally compelling, and that just cemented it right there for me. I'm like, yeah. oh, wow. And I made the decision right then and there. And because, and then I ended up going to the local comic book stores at, then and coming across, that's where I first discovered Jack Kirby and Commandy and the Eternals. I loved the Eternals and uh, Mobius. I got exposed to European artists really young. Oh, wow. And, yeah. And all that stuff kind of just planted itself in my brain. And I never, and then from that, you know, like age 10 or whatever, I just like, nope, that's what I'm going to do. I literally proclaimed it out loud, like you said yourself. <laughs> and like, I'm going to be a comic book artist. And I did not give myself any other option. It was probably the stupidest decision because it's like, <laughs> if it didn't work out, I don't know what the hell would have happened. <laughs> you know? so. Yeah, <laughs> That's so fun to hear. Cause like my, mine, and I think Sean too, we both really, the touch point for us was, the Ninja Turtle comics and how they took yeah. the toys and Stephen Murphy had like these serious kind of uh, thematic issues and things like that yep. in it. And that was the thing. And then, and then for me, it was my, I went to get uh, Ninja Turtles and my brother grabbed X-Men number one by Jim Lee. Okay. And we well. went back to grandma's house and swapped comics and same like yep. poof, so it was a yep. toy and then x-men and right. then yeah telling my parents and they go oh fuck he's never gonna have a girlfriend and he's always gonna <laughs> eat macaroni <laughs> like but okay and, and, yeah well uh, and, and and for if you have a parent who has not read comics themselves or if their right. comic exposure was like limited to age seven or something like you basically are telling them hey i'm gonna design macaroni mobiles uh yeah. for the rest of my life right yeah i mean exactly. as far as <laughs> yeah they're really <laughs> He's going to be a, a perpetual child, which is not bad, I guess. I guess I can say I'm a perpetual child at my age. is fine. <laughs> it, yeah, and it was a great to, decision because you pulled yeah. it off, so it worked. Yeah. Well, and, like, and, and, luckily, and yeah. the, there seems to be something about the, the early childhood experience when you see a real young kid. I, I, I've got two kids. Um, they're four and seven. And when you see a really young kid drawing, uh, it's almost like they're attempting to manipulate things in a very similar kind of way as when they play with a toy, you know, yes. they, they have this vessel that is inhabiting their, whatever it is they're imagining. And they kind of want to have the vessel have agency in the world and everything. Yes. And it seems like the kids that have the real drawing magic, like they get that bug in them. It's like, they've realized that their pencil or pen or whatever is a pathway to that same kind of manipulation, which yes. might kind of explain why that, you know, the Micronauts thing hit you so hard is because like you, you had the object prior to that, right? You had those yes. toys. Mm. Yeah. 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 And in, in, inventing my own stories surrounding the characters. I had no idea. You know, when I read the comic, I had no, that was all new to me. I was already creating my own stories on these characters. But then when I got exposed to the comic, I ended up applying what I was reading in the comic to playing with these toys. And yeah. Right, it added to the narrative in my own head, you know? Yeah. Did you cut, did you start creating your own characters? Cause that was one of my initial responses too, is I'm making my own mutants. 
like <laughs> like Ninja did. Turtle mutants, not X Men mutants. The weird thing for me is I did not start creating my own characters until after that. Um, mm -hmm. But I, when I started creating my own characters, I quickly dived into like, oh, well, this is this person's story. This is, mm -hmm. you know, this is what this person is about. Um, so I quickly had weird little narratives. I don't know if some of that also, in early high school, we got into D&D. &D. Uh, okay. I had a friend that was into that and that was very narrative driven. And that maybe helped uh, propel that, creating characters that have story behind them. Yeah. So it wasn't just visual. Cause like, I, I think the yeah. tendency for a young person or at least me is like, okay, how many like Rob Liefeld pouches can I design on, you know, it was in, right. almost entirely visual for me at that right. point. Well, yeah, it's interesting that you said that the D&D &D is a narrative because it's almost as though the, the manuals, like especially like a dungeon master manual or something like that is essentially giving you like a cheat sheet to narrative. You know, it's uh -huh. not that different than reading like a how to write romance books or something. Uh -huh. Uh, yeah. You know, something that is attempting to lay out something in a prescriptive kind of way can be really useful to sort of get the to the heart of it. That's an interesting, interesting thing. So so what we've learned so far is if you want to be a uh, fantastic uh, <laughs> illustrator such as yourself, you need to play with toys that have comics and then uh, <laughs> role play. D &D. Yes. I was deprived of the D&D because &D it was seen as satanic in the 80s. That's what so happened, my parents Carson. wouldn't let me do it. You yeah, so yeah unfortunately, at that point, I was living with my dad and he's like, whatever, you're having fun, whatever. He didn't <laughs> pay much attention to that part of it. And I didn't do I didn't do the D&D &D thing for very long. It was only a couple of years. And then I started like getting more, uh, more involved in the comics collecting and following narrative through comics. and a little bit of novels, you know, like fantasy novels and stuff like that, Conan books and like the Robert E. Howard stuff and things like that. And I, I got exposed to like fantasy novels from uh, the, my friend that was running the D&D thing. He was, they were gonzo over Robert E. Howard Conan stuff. Um, and then that led me to uh, uh, other fantasy stuff so like at that time i wasn't really reading a lot of fantasy comics a lot of i mean marvel pretty much dominant marvel dc dominated the local area like pretty much anywhere else at that time but fortunately i ended up going to comic stores that had lots of independent comics and so i got exposed to a lot of different things early on one of the things i immediately gravitated to was uh p craig russell's stuff on um elric Mm -hmm. And that, then I discover, oh, Elric is actually, this is an adaptation of, you know, a series of novels. And that led me to Michael Moorcock. And now I'm, a, you know, I became this huge Gonzo Michael Moorcock fan, you know. Um, so there's a lot of interesting narratives in there. Of course, also around that time that that impacted me for narrative, you know, Star Wars arrived, right? Mm -hmm. You know, in the late 70s. And as a kid and you're into these you know science fictiony toys and then star wars comes and you've been watching star trek old star trek on tv and ultraman and all this stuff so these dynamic visuals like star wars presented visuals that you're like what the hell is that you know the 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 opening scene of star wars when it's so powerful iconography when all the rebel soldiers are lining up because they're about to be boarded and attacked and they're in this white hall and then getting ready and the doors blast open white stormtroopers come in it's all this white and then this lone dark figure of darth vader steps through and you're like what you know <laughs> as a young as a young mind that's so like imprints in your brain and but is it yeah it's a dynamic visual but the visual represents this entire narrative behind it and so all these things were coming at me at the same time and so I couldn't help but think narratively in terms of visual, I think. It was just like, I don't know how I could have avoided it. <laughs> yeah. Well, and it, I, I want to uh, ask you about this right now because you, you're, you're kind of touching on it when you're, when you're building in your, your film memory here. Uh, we, Carson and I were kind of arguing a little bit about your, ref, your use of reference uh, uh -huh. while you're actually working. Uh, and I specifically wanted to ask you about how you visualize in your brain before you're actually putting an image on the paper. Uh, like if you were to 
um, you know, if I were to ask you about that scene right now, do you think that you could sketch that out from what you are seeing in your brain right now? Like, is that a close approximation? I would say, okay. of course, there'd be details that are not correct, uh, but I can envision it. I, I can, I can right now. I can see him stepping through the door, the steam going off, the laser fire going off, and he's stepping through. And the next thing you know, he's grabbing that. Right. You know, a uh, rebel soldier and lifting him off the ground. I can see it all as if I'm still watching the movie uh, in my head. Um, and 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 if you were going to draw that right now, how much of the the sort of finessing is an interaction between what you're seeing on the page as you draw, or or is it solely like sort of putting out the thing that you're pre visualizing? Is there is there like a give and take? Like you were to sit down and yeah. do a panel right now, um, yeah, are, are you just yeah, I'd say there's give and take because even though my mind can crystallize it, the mm -hmm. translation from that, because it's constantly moving in a way in my mind, yeah. right? so the crystallization of that to the paper, you know, there would be things I would definitely would struggle with. Um, uh, so I have a better ability to look at something that's a photo uh -huh. and remember the photo. It's okay. still object doesn't move. I, I have this weird thing. I don't, I know there's a term for it, but I don't know what's called, but I can imagine an object in my head. Okay. And turn it completely in every angle, even in angles that I had not seen before. So I can, the only time I ever need photo reference is if it's for a particular, like, hey, I need this particular gun. All right. right? It's, then, okay, I got to look at the gun. But I don't sit there and hold the gun, the photo of the gun as I'm drawing. I study it and I look at it and I set it away and then I purposefully will draw it at an angle I did not see. Mm -hmm. um, so on a technical level, like if someone was to examine the drawing, they're like, oh yeah, that's not quite right. The angle mm -hmm. here, that feature of the gun is not quite right. So it's an imagination of the, the real object. <clears throat> I can extrapolate in 3D pretty well and imagine what things would look like if I saw it from that angle. I, I don't know why I do that, but I have always been able to do that on purpose. Um, and the other reason why I tend to put the photos away after looking at something is it allows, it allows me to make sure the drawing, the drawing remains a drawing. Yeah. You know, it's, a, it's okay for those flaws to be there because it's an <laughs> approximation anyway, right? Right. So, but yeah, I have a tendency to, my brain is constantly analyzing whatever I'm looking at in visual terms. Um, so as an example, as we're talking on the screen, my, my mind right now is analyzing every shadow on your face, every line right. on your face, it's just automatic. Um, and I can, rem I can recall those things in basic terms. Right. But yeah. I couldn't and say, I couldn't like look at your photo or your video, mm -hmm. put it away and then draw you Right. So it's almost like whatever I'm seeing then gets translated into whatever I'm needing to create. If that makes sense. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Oh, it, I, I, uh, we're, we're part of the reason that, you know, I, we're, we're kind of drilling down on this is because in my estimation, you know, you are a person who has a tremendous command of that particular skill in terms of, you know, your ability to render on top of that um, idealized rotated form, you know, uh, yeah. the, the, I guess the, the first time I actually encountered that as a sort of concept that was separate from anything else was um, uh, Sergio, uh, Sergio Argonne's uh, describing oh, yes. having to draw a kimono um, and being irritated uh, by not being able to draw a kimono and then realizing that he needed to learn how to put it on first. Uh, <laughs> That's amazing. And, yeah. and 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 the thing is, is that you know, like the, it made perfect sense to me. Like, oh, that's the that's the thing that I need, you know. Uh -huh. um, but 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 uh, you know, Carson and I have talked about the the past couple decades, like in terms of, um, you know, you go into a life drawing class or something like that. Oftentimes, mm -hmm. you know, the 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 emphasis is on the sort of Betty Edwards, like, you know, you need to learn how to see this as a flat object. Uh -huh. um, and, and not look at it in a sort of structural sense. And it seems like the structural sense has been most of the purview of like the animation side uh, uh -huh. and, and, and things like that. And like a little bit less in sort of the 
you know, uh, I don't know exactly why, <laughs> why <laughs> I'm, I'm, get, I'm getting off track here, but uh, no, I, 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 because you have that ability to do that and then have the rendering be so sophisticated and attached to that. I mean, the, the, the thing that was just blowing my mind uh, reading Echo Lands was, um, I, I'm, I'm not gonna remember the character's name, I'm sorry, the, the character who's a Jack Kirby uh, homage. Oh yeah, uh, Romulus, uh-huh. Yeah, Romulus, yeah. thank you. Uh, yeah, um, of course I should remember his name. Uh, Romulus, I was pointing out to, to Carson as we were reading back through the book, I was like, you know, Kirby would never draw it from this angle, but right. you're you're nailing Kirby at a, at a at a angle that Kirby never drew a figure from. Um, right. And, you know, it's just because he's, he's working three pages a day and this is the viewpoints that he's comfortable with. And this is, a, yeah. you straight out of the zone and yet it was like Kirby, like Kirby, right. Kirby, you know? Yeah. And, right. and that was when I was like, oh man, like this, you know, this, how did you do that? So, I mean, you know, is this just a thing? Like, are we just looking at somebody who has like, you know, is a combination of uh, inheritance and uh, learn skill? Like, how did you drill this particular thing? When did you know that the other people didn't have this, I guess? Might be a better way. I never really, I never really thought about it. Um, it just was like everything's been, everything I do with my work has always been very instinctual and just kind of by my gut. Um, so when I, you know, I don't know if like with the Kirby thing, if it's like essentially it might boil down to in terms of like really analyzing what's happening structurally is everything, even if I'm dabbling with some sort of different technique that's not what would be my considered my standard style, mm -hmm. everything still has the same understructure to it. Mm. So everything's still, no matter what, uh, what style I'm trying to mess with, the understructure stays the same. And that actually might be one of the reasons why I've had people ask me like, how are you getting these characters to interact on this on the page been be various styles but yet it feels like they share the i actually share the space and i think that might be part of the trick is is no matter what i do the understructure is still the way i perceive the reality and everything else on top of it is sort of the trappings of, over it you know the, mm. the, the the clothes over the bones you know um right. but in terms of like i've never I've never really had any conversations with other uh, creators and stuff about how that function works and how other creators think and, and get to those places. Um, so for me, it's always been like, it's just always kind of been there. And the funny thing about it is, you know, when I look at my really old crappy drawings from when I was a kid, they're really bad. And I, so I don't know when that shift occurred where I was able to start diving into that. And it, it's almost, it's magic almost, you know, where, I don't know, it's just weird. What, I think one of the things that helped in that maybe is at one point when I was trying to get into the comics industry and everyone's telling me, oh, you need to draw this way or you need to draw that way or whatever. And I was not getting anywhere. Um, my wife convinced me at that point, she's like, draw the way you want to draw. Hmm. Just, and so, uh, I, I really stuck with me and I started just like uh, tackling things however I wanted to at that point. So, and that maybe helped a lot uh, making that leap in some way, you know? Yeah. I have like 5 million questions that came out of those statements and I'm going to try and figure out which one to start with first. Like, I think the first one that came to my head is you're talking about the structural consistency underneath. Uh -huh. But one of the things I find so impressive about how you deal with style is I don't think there are structural similarities because you're what I would what I would say is your like native style is pretty realistic and and the reason yeah. Sean was digging at this is because when we were looking at Echo Lance he he said oh you know it's you can tell he's using photo reference and all the lighting and I said man you know I I, I asked him about this on the Wildstorm message boards back when I was like 19 <laughs> and he told me he doesn't use any photo reference and I've yeah. heard other people say that and he was like no look at the lighting on this guy's face <laughs> And, it's all and, memory i just remember shit <laughs> yeah but like he was like like no this isn't but so th that natural style you have like my instinct when i first saw it too is that look photo photo reference is pretty realistic and that mm -hmm. that that carries over to the structural stuff like the proportions and when you go to kirby the proportional the the kind of underlying structural stuff you can't just do the kirby rendering style and get no. kirby you have to have the structural distortions 
You've got the right. plane. You, have, of, to, you yeah. have to have an understanding of the style that you're trying to fuck with, really, right? So, yeah. Um, so one of the things that dawned on me a long time about time ago about Kirby, well before I actually became a genuine fan of Kirby. Mm-hmm. I mean, I read co- Kirby comics when I was a kid and I was mesmerized by the the bombacity and the strangeness and the imaginative stuff. But I don't think I really was like, oh, I'm a Kirby fan. You know what I mean? Until mm-hmm. I got a little bit older. And then I started thinking about particularly his uh, mid to later period stuff. And then discovering the really weird stuff that he would do where he would do these elaborate things where you're like, what am I looking at? Or the giant space heads and all this yeah. stuff. And I started looking at that. And at that point, I was uh, studying a lot of various kinds of art. And I picked up on something in terms of, of relating to Kirby's understructure. Uh, and it even became a question. I met this uh, Kirby author, uh, 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 expert guy. He wrote a book about Kirby and stuff. And I went and saw a lecture to, of his and he ended up taking questions from the audience. And I'm like, hey, do you know, having known Kirby and all this stuff, do you know, was he a, into cubism? Right? <laughs> and he's like, because I'm like, everything about his understructure is all geometric shapes yeah and and he's like oh i've never been asked that before i don't know i have no idea and i'm like yeah i mean if you the the more he evolved the more gym geometry is going on in yeah. under the structure and so w- when i came to that realization i'm like okay that's really what matters if i'm going to try to capture an essence of Kirby is to try to capture that aspect. And that's the thing I struggle with the most. Every, every time I draw Romulus, I was like, I didn't get that right the last time. What do I do this time to try to get it better? And so every time I draw him, it's this constant evolution of trying to understand how Kirby was able to do that. And then Kirby did that in so, such rapid speed. Um, it's and, and the end result, what's fascinating to me is that he would have all this cubist, cubism structure under his drawings, but then the end result is just on fire with life. Yeah. You know, that, that paradox is so fascinating to me. And um, so I'm constantly trying to like, hmm, what can I do here to try to see if I understand this further, you know? And that is far from correct, but it, um, yeah, I, because I think my 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 realistic tendencies start to cr- creep in there, and so it's mm. a little bit of a, a fight between the two, abstract thinking, realistic thinking, and so it lends to it ends up doing things like what you're saying. You have a Kirby drawing of of an angle you he doesn't normally do, you right. know, because I think those two things are kind of conflicting with each other. It's fascinating. Well, I, and, and, I think that's like what we that, that's what we we're like oh my god this is so fascinating like and and hearing you talk about it like how deep you get into it then it's like you're doing that for every one of those characters that you do in a different style you have this yes. much oh, this yes. is, <laughs> that's <Yes>. crazy <laughs> I, I, oh, yes. I, I don't i i don't want to ask you i mean is it going to be like a is it going to spoil it for somebody if i ask you to break them out i mean because we were arguing back and forth about uh, uh-huh. Particularly, uh, you know, Red's uh, Red sidekick, her her romantic uh, interest. And, oh yeah, yeah. And his his origins. I mean, I, I don't. I, if it's not if it's not something you want to talk about, that's totally no. Fine it's too, fine. But... I have no okay. I have no no problems talking about my influences because I kind of wear them on my sleeve already, in a lot of ways. So, and this kind of dives into a little bit of something that I get asked about sometimes because I dabble in style, you know. Uh, why do I do it? And that kind of started a little bit when I was on chase where I'm like, oh, let's try this, this shot using these techniques or whatever, just like a little dabbling here and there. And I think back in, bear with me for a second, this is a little extrapolating, um, but when I was in school, I didn't have any formal art training. The only the only art school stuff I really focused on, I had two years of advertising art and design. Okay. And the number one thing I learned from that was the teacher liked how well I could draw and he would use my skills as an example, but he would always go, 
Now, you know, that, that's executed well, but what makes what he's doing there work is the thought behind the drawing. That matters more. The, I, what is the drawing trying to say? What is it trying to do? And that really sunk in on me. And then when I started studying different art, I'm like trying to, I'm taking, I'm applying that same mentality when I'm studying other art. I'm like, what is that doing to me? Why, why is it affecting me this way versus this other thing over here is affecting me in a different way. And then so I started becoming interested in, in exploring um, in terms of comics narrative, like, huh, if I draw this panel in this way, this is what I kind of feel from it. Will, it, will the reader feel that same thing? I don't know, but they're gonna feel something and they're gonna feel something that's different than the panel before it. And then that started going even further, like when I got onto Promethea is a great example of this. Right. Cause Alan, Alan was all about like, what can we do? And I was willing to jump over the cliff with him. And so that really opened up my mind to exploring further art. The series in a lot of ways was a love letter to art and different kinds of art. Um, and then that's when I, an epiphany happened to me. Cause like when I was a young kid and I'm like, oh, I'm gonna be a comic book artist. And I'm gonna be like, like, look how great Michael Golden is or John Byrne, their styles are so distinct and this and that. And I was, uh, almost egotistically looking for what is my style, right? Mm -hmm. What is going to make me stand out from everyone? And then when I got onto Promethea, that all went away. And it became about like, oh yeah, no. I have certain tendencies I gravitate to, um, just the uh, natural inclinations, but I tried to, um, I immediately started going, well, I don't want to sit there and try to focus on that. I want to be under, understanding that style is uh, anything I do is not going to be original. Even 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 in my own natural inclinations, somebody's already been there. Someone's already treaded that water. So I became more about like, well, what can I learn from exploring these things? And uh, and so I became all about that. And that ended up going further as I started working with different characters and going, hmm, this character, this character speaks to me in this way. I kind of see him like this. That's what I'm going to do. I don't care if he's standing next to so-and-so who doesn't hit me that <laughs> way. And I'm drawing that person in a different way. I started to not care about those things because I started thinking about like, if a, if a, if a Rembrandt painting affects you differently than a Van Gogh painting, there's multiple reasons for that. There's no reason why that cannot be applied to comics narrative and use the, those ideas of the emotional context, whether it's overt or subvert uh, or subliminal. I mean, that uh, there's no reason not to do it. You might as, well, might as well do it and see what happens. And some styles are very particular, like Kirby, we can pick that out. That's painfully obvious. But there's other styles where I'll, I'll fuss with something and it might be an amalgam of things in one character mm -hmm. or a very particular thing I'm going for. And I'm all about like, even if the reader doesn't understand the reference, that's okay. That character, the way they come across visually is going to affect the way they respond to that character. Right, yeah. So like with Core, my initial thoughts with Core was sort of like this scratchy, Sinkavichy, uh, alternative superhero kind of thing, but he's obviously not a superhero. Um, but then there's a little mix of, I'd say some of the scratchier European guys mm -hmm. mixed in there, but creeped in. And so he's like, this became this amalgam of those various things, um, which is, I love that. And so he ends up becoming very distinct from Hope and everyone else, you know. But the yeah. tricky thing for him is just completely ignoring proper anatomy. <laughs> That's the toughest thing because he's like <laughs> hulking guy, you know. It's like, and I, I struggle with that all the time. I'm like, no, that no, he needs to be more like this mountain. It's like completely not realistic. <laughs> uh, but I think we were we were going like Sinkevich, um, uh, Klaus Jansen, Sergio Topi, uh, yeah. 
Well, uh, I yeah, I was I was totally off the mark because I was saying like Arthur uh, Art Adams, like uh, you know no. mid mid eighties Art Adams inked by somebody with a, a, a lot more vigor, you know. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. Just just because he had the he had the sort of like you know like I'm thinking of like the you know the Asgard uh, you know curly oh. haired uh, yeah. you know Adams. Uh, of the like you know new mutants annuals and things like that but you know no i i just i was just kind of fishing around because you know obviously he's like you said he's an amalgam but um yeah. it's just uh, the characters like romulus i mean obviously you know that one was more direct and so yes. i kind of felt like i was i was uh searching in the dark for but i mean yeah. it, uh, it you know you you i'm very curious to find out because you've you've uh, hit on echo lands you've hit on a uh, a concept that suits this so well so like taking it back to the project that like you know the Promethea where you 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 know for first taking these stylistic things and really turning the apple cart over um how much of uh that what was Alan kind of responding to the thing that you were capable of doing like was he like realizing the magic trick and like yes you know I'm gonna push this further and further because you kept on taking it and you kept on putting it back out <laughs> yeah yeah and that became really uh profound in the second big arc of the series mm -hmm. what, we, what Alan and I would call the Kabbalah quest yeah and so as the character started moving into different planes of reality uh we would start I would start having conversations with him like you know he's like He's like, oh, you know, the, this part of this reality is all about trying to understand your relationship with your father and, and fatherhood and stuff like that. And for whatever reason, again, it'd be a little bit kind of instinctual in my gut reaction to, to things. I'm like, oh, you know, I think this might be cool if we, this whole thing is, this whole reality is like impressionist painting, you know, and, and not inspired by just one impressionist, but many different kind of impressionists. And he's like, that's amazing let's let's do that you know uh or like um the the issue uh that follow that follows that where it all of a sudden becomes like uh really chunky woodblock cuts like mm -hmm. right, stamped on kind of thing that was the sort of thing i'm like hey this 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 rigidness of this block cut thing really i felt like fits with his uh because he started talking about religion and uh, and biblical dog dogmatism in it, and so I'm like, oh, that rigidness I think would really suit this, and it and it was fascinating because as we started working, even though his Promethea always had like these really um, surreal and pretty design sense and layouts and stuff like that, so when that got applied using the idea of the, the block cuts. All of a sudden, you end up with shapes that are like, oh, it's a woodblock kind of, kind of thing, but it also kind of reminds me of a stained glass on a church window, mm, you know, right. kind of because it's those hard cuts with the color and the compositions. So all that stuff, it, I, it, it was a great example of how those things could affect the reader, and they would get something different from from it. Um, I just love that. And comics, it's amazing, you know, because comics is per, is a perfect medium for that sort of thing. Um, yeah well and that and particular yet... storyline that the kabbalah quest part of promethea um when i said that you know that like you set the course for like the next 10 years of my life almost it was your style play on that particular 12 issue chunk of that story that opened my eyes up to what you're talking about the yeah the visceral impact of style and then also the symbolic which I think is what you're describing now, the symbolic yeah. resonance that you can pack into something by switching a style. Yeah. And that turned me onto like the same thing where I don't have a style. Right. It, like I consider it like my style is the adaptability. Yes. Like, and, and I learned that from, from what you guys were doing on those issues. And then Alan's such a convincing writer about all that stuff. I got obsessed with Kabbalah. Yeah, unfortunately yeah. for 10 years of my life you know I was, I was like doing paintings about it and yeah. stuff but um it was that style stuff that sold it and and that has yeah I think that was one of the big things that we wanted to talk about because we both uh -huh. like that kind of play with style as well yeah. so it's really interesting to hear how intentional it is yeah 
Yeah, and for and, and as I went, it, some of my thinking on that developed before I really got into comics professionally. I was trying to do things when I was breaking in. I was trying to do things like, oh, what happens if I do this with this story, and started thinking about drawing to what the story is telling me it needs instead of me telling them what the telling what the story needs it's telling yeah. me let listen to that and let that guide me but before i had that epiphany another going back in history to my uh younger days uh as just as a comics fan the first person i noticed that really was like hey style can go out the window uh is frank miller and when you look at Frank Miller's work, when from before he took over Daredevil, he had a lot more of a traditional comics thing going on. Then when he moved on to Daredevil, he started to get a little bit more freer and playful. And then after Daredevil, he moves on to things like Ronin and Dark Knight and then Sin City. And all those things are so dynamically different. There's a signature thing that he does that you can go, yes, that's a Frank Miller ism in the way he tries to tell a story but he was messing around with style and was kind of like i'm not going to be adhered to one thing and that sunk in on me as a, a comics fan that was a really impressionable to me and uh probably helped create my whole idea of like yeah why not you know um and see what happens uh so it seemed like to me like some of the times when he would change his style it was very much like this is what the story was telling him to do. Like when you look at yeah. Ronan, you can't imagine it being drawn any other way, right? And um, and Ronan's divided into five chapters, and each chapter, yeah. like this is the Moebius, this is the Lone yeah. Wolf and yeah. Cub, and by the last one, all of a sudden you get the the high tenebrism, black and white Sin yeah. City thing. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah. It's so fascinating, and um, and so I kind of I don't know for me. I, I started wanting to do that sort of thing because I felt like I would learn from it. I could grow as an artist and yeah. um, and uh, expand my tool set. Uh, but I tried to do it in a way that was, I felt intuitive to the work, um, what the story was telling me it needed. That ended up getting applied heavily after Promethea when I did, you know, uh, Batman the Black Glove with Grant. Um, that That became really, integral to how that thing worked having that mindset to the art yeah and i i i did for myself a parody of grant's run on batman <laughs> and there's a two-page spread where e each page is in the style of different artists and there's a two-page spread where i was doing you but part of doing you was to do especially on the Batman run was to do five other styles. And I was like, how the <laughs> fuck do I make this look like a J.H. Williams when I also have to draw like these well, guys? The, the other it, funny it, thing about Batman that I've noticed, because I've gotten to draw Batman at different times in my career. And it's so funny. I, and this is completely by accident, but every time I would go and do a Batman story, I would draw him differently. <laughs> it just would change. For whatever reason, I don't know why. And so that, yeah, I can understand how that might be frustrating. <laughs> so. Well, but it, it can't, well, the, 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 like your natural style is, is a, that's something that I could latch onto. But then when you start throwing in other artists, you're so good at mimicking the other artists. It's like, well, you just have to mimic the others. So what I came to was that what, what makes your work distinctive is your compositions. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And and that you you kind of have to look at that. And so I'm curious about how that developed for you, because I can't think of a precedent in comics. Like I see a lot of people taking what you've done now, but I'm I'm curious, like where that developed. Yeah, we 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 were uh, just both blown away by the layouts, especially in Echo Lands, and uh, having dissected a bunch of uh, Gene Day, Master of Kung Fu, we were like, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Carson was like, it, just wait until you you read a <laughs> you read Echo Land shot. It's Actually, like, that's that's correct. When you when you had me read that, I said, "There's the fucking precedent." But I don't want to. That's that's true. Yeah. I forgot about that. No, but I'm curious I don't, I don't about put, that. 
I, yeah, so too many. We're bringing up too many topics of conversation. I apologize in advance. Oh no, it's but, fine. It's great. I love it. <laughs> I, I, so, so, so you you choose uh, choose your own adventure. Are, are you going to tell us how in the hell uh, you you uh, lay out a horizontal comic uh, for the first time, or are you going to tell us uh, about how Gene Day, Master of Kung Fu, uh, uh, planted seeds in your brain uh, at a young age that have uh, turned into giant raptors now? Yeah, um, we'll do a little bit of both. So, um, <laughs> might as well, right? that's what this is about. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, Gene Day, uh, Master of Kung Fu, along with Paul Galassi, all that stuff had a huge impression on me as a kid. I didn't, the weird part of, this is funny because this applies to the, the weird things that happen to the, to the human mind. A lot of those things were not evident to me until later after my comics career was kicked in. And then when I would go back and see those things again, like when the when Marvel put out the omnibuses for Master of Kung Fu, Kung Fu I was like, right. yes, right on. I haven't seen that since I was, you know, a little tight. Right. And then when I started looking through, I'm like, holy shit, this is all like in here, you know, and um, the, I, like, I, I can't believe that our unfounded speculation has some kind of origin. And I, I, I just I just want to. <laughs> take, a, take a moment of appreciation and, uh, <laughs> and i'd say also um definitely steranko yeah uh, okay. right yeah the Stranko stuff you know like the little bit of captain american shield stuff of course <clears throat> um uh, uh particularly like if you ever get to see or you probably have seen it but his adaptation of the movie outland have you ever seen oh, that I no i haven't seen that Stranko. oh my god it's storytelling genius um uh some of that has got double page spreads going on in it too okay. uh uh early jim starlin stuff you know where he some of his layout he would get some really weird layouts going on um the dreaminess of p craig russell mm. appealed to me he didn't necessarily extrapolate in uh like how far could you push a comic book page but he was so good at making the page he was working on have the absolute perfect flow uh you know just fantastic um yeah he's so all a musical that's, yeah thing. right yeah and so all that stuff and a lot of those things those influences on me didn't set in well I, they had set in but i didn't understand them mm -hmm. that the the life they lived in my head until later when i started exploring different things uh and then would come across this thing like from Master of Kung Fu or Steranko and go, oh yeah, of course. <laughs> and it would actually reinforce my, my perspective about the originality thing that we were talking about in terms of style. I'm like, that person has been here before, I had seen it, and it obviously made some sort of subliminal impression on my brain and it regurgitated itself out later when I was able to actually try to do something interesting you know um so right. oh go ahead oh and 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 i think these are these are definitely mysterious processes and you know if, yes. if we could talk if we could talk to gene day humble guy as he was uh you know and ask him about this i'm sure that he would say oh i was just ripping off steranko you know <laughs> uh, you know I, I i just took the yeah. steranko thing of having panels across yeah. the thing and, and apply that to multiple pages right but the yeah. thing is is that you know gene day a uh, wonderful person that he was, was told not to do that anymore. And then he went and made five pages in a row uh, right. that all have a continuous background right. uh, that turn into one giant horizontal thing, which was the thing that like specifically with Echo Lands that like the way that you are using that horizontal space to, and especially when you're when you're carrying multiple threads like that, I mean, it's just staggering stuff. And, oh, and you. Uh, you know, you know from, from a, just a pure structural standpoint, even if you were rendering the entire thing, you know, in the style of Boris the Bear or, or uh, <laughs> something, it would be something to study, you know. Um, uh, no offense to the Boris the Bear artist, who I don't recall. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so, um, so, so yeah, I mean, layout structure, you know, okay, this goes back, okay, going way back to like the little bit of Judge Dredd stuff I did. I was trying to do weird, some interesting layout structures there, but they were very rudimentary. I mean, they were just like the bare bones of trying to do stuff. And I had done 
tried to dabble with some of those things in in work that no one has seen when I was trying to break in. Mm -hmm. This guy kind of goes back to the idea of doing a different style depending on what the story is telling me. When I first was trying to break in, uh, I was working on two different comics at the same time. One was like this urban vigilante, dark, really dark thing. It was at the time when The Crow was super popular. And so the writer was <laughs> all into that stuff. And then I was doing this uh, adult science fiction fantasy thing. Uh, and I approached each one in a completely different art style because that's mm -hmm. what they needed. So um, when it comes down to the layouts and stuff, I was trying to always trying to look for the different angle. So like when I was doing the Judge Dredd thing, I tried to look, oh, let's do this and try that. And it was all rudimentary. And it was a lot of that um, processes that my advertising art and design teacher was talking about. I was like, what are you trying to do here? And the more I did that, the more I try, the more uh, I wanted to do that. And I, it just kept feeding on itself. And so by the time I get to Chase, we're doing a couple interesting things structurally there where we'll have you know set of panels here and maybe another set of panels here but then the middle part would be all text and it's literally written like the script from a play uh, that kind of thing um, and then when I got the job for Promethea uh, being an Alan Moore fan understanding okay I'm dealing with this master writer who if I understand the things I've read from him before, this guy will do anything. He's willing to try anything. And so, and Promethea being, uh, was it Superman? Was it Batman? Was it any of those things that were already known? It's all brand new from the ground level up. I kind of said, okay, I can, I'm gonna try these things and try all this stuff. Alan loved that and it fed him and then it returned back to me and fed me. And we kept going back and forth and seeing what we could do with the comic book page. And it quickly became like, oh, what can we do with the two pages? And Alan <laughs> loved that idea. Like, no, every two pages, it's going to be a thing. And so we kept trying to push that. And then we tried to push it beyond that. Um, and then after Promethea, I, I did that. Uh, uh, I ended up going to Desolation Jones uh, with Warren Ellis on that. That brought out different things in me. Uh, I had some double page spread things going on in there, but I started thinking about them in terms of like, hmm, like Sunday adventure strips, you know, mm -hmm. even though it was like this crime fiction book, right? Um, <laughs> so I was doing like these weird layouts with that. Uh, and then I started thinking about style in terms of function be beyond like the surface on that book a lot. So Promethea style came up in terms of what does it do to you emotionally? But then on Desolation Jones, I started thinking about style. What does it do to you mechanically? Mm -hmm. So the, how something can move. So a great example of what I mean is on Desolation Jones, there would be instances where when some action would begin, I would start to use like hard cuts of flashes of white and, or just all red, like mm -hmm. these really painful to look at things because it would hit you mechanically uh but on an emotional level and other things like i started thinking about like huh this is this is an, got an action book it's a violent crime noir thing the action is extreme how do you apply action movie uh mentality to a book like this and action movies love their slow motion takes and things like that so i'm like how do you do slow motion in a comic i'm like you could break it down like Every little beat is its own little panel. But then I was like, but we've seen that before. So what could I do differently? And so I, there's a couple moments where the action kicks in. All of a sudden I go black and white because I still want it to be red like action. Right. But make you kind of pause in the moment of the action. So I started doing things like, okay, everything's all normal, normal, normal. Well, as normal as Jones was. And then the action would kick in and I would go black and white, but then all my shadows would be crosshatch. Mm -hmm. And it forces the eye to do this weird thing where you're like, yes, the action is immediate, but I'm paused on that figure because of the detail in the figure you have to, you can't help it. So it was almost like, oh, maybe that's the akin, that's akin to a slow motion shot in an action mm -hmm. movie. 
And so I started, that was around the time I started thinking about those things mechanically. And then that extrapolated into even further, like with Batman, the black glove, and even things in Batwoman where there's some moments I and I tried to not repeat myself as much as possible, but there were some bits in Batwoman where like she's in a fight and all of a sudden it becomes an x-ray and you see the damage she's doing yeah. and she hits the guy, you know, that kind of thing. And it again, that was sort of the action movie idea. Like, how do you make that action slow down for a moment? Uh yeah, it's weird. And then layouts with Echo Lands became because I've been doing the double page thing a lot by that point, like all, all like almost all of Batwoman is, right? But when we designed Echo Lands, I started thinking about it. And it's funny because we came up with this idea before I even did Batwoman, uh, where we wanted it to be sideways. We wanted it to be landscape just to see what it could do. Um, and then when I started working on it, it, it ended up being the absolute right choice, even if it drives some readers nuts, which I know it has. <laughs> it's the right, it's the right decision for the tale being told. Oh yeah. So, so yeah. it feels like this panoramic <laughs> epic thing because that's what we're what we're trying to do with this thing is a big blockbustery type of concept here. Um, but the movement, like you, what you were bringing up, how to make that function is so difficult it is incredibly difficult um it changed the way i approach a page and it changed the way we write a page um and it had a steep learning curve so like when i started working on it normally when i work on a project i feel like i, I get my sea legs on a project by the time the first issue's done mm -hmm. this one it took two and a half issues or so before i felt like okay i think i i think i understand what's going on here but even but even then, like pages I've done recently, I'm like what it takes so much more time to figure it out to make sure it functions, um, uh, and that's super fascinating. And what I love about the 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 landscape thing, it really tr forces your eye to move from left to right more than any other comic. Um, right. And uh, there's times where I purposefully try to force you to break that um just because uh to keep it fresh and constantly never staying the same thing that's partly to keep from being bored myself um yeah. uh but yeah echo lands is super, incredibly challenging uh, and i i'm happy that the people that have gravitated to the format um are seeing that and understand why it's that way i remember hearing from a retailer in in uh <laughs> like la area and they were they ended up messaging me saying when i first saw that it was going to be landscape format i had huge trepidations i didn't know like he's like why is he doing this <laughs> you know and then he goes but after it came out and i saw the first issue he's like i understand why it's this way it, there's no other way to do this, you know, yeah. to do it in that way. And the, the other thing psychologically for me, uh, which is something uh, Eric Stevenson at Image brought up about the format, uh, was Echo Lands is this unique world that we're trying to do that is an echo of so many things, but sort of on its side, um, that when the format alone with Echo Lands, just by turning it landscape and it reads differently, immediately sets the tone, you are in the Echo Lands world, just by its shape alone, uh, which I thought was super fascinating, right? Um, that it might have that effect. Yeah. Well, that, that story time. like hits the ground running and it's just like yeah. propulsion the whole time. Yeah. And as soon as you move into that horizontal format, like there really is a sense of, like you have to work with that motion in a mm -hmm. way that you're not going this way. You're, you're propelling forward constantly, yeah. which is yeah. a, a very visceral sense in the book. And so that that's interesting to me because then you're taking your mechanics that you're talking about of style and now you're applying it to the, the formatting of the book. Yeah. And it literally was like, we knew going in that it would be a gamble because let's face it, the comics industry doesn't make books that are horizontal very much. There's been some here or there, but it's not a thing. Um, and so we knew going in, it was going to be 
a risk, but for me, based on everything else I had done up to this point, I'm like, you know, even like when you look at Salmon Overture going all the way back through Promethea, uh, it was sort of like, yeah, no, I have to do it. I have to see what is possible. Can I make this work? So it's almost like a self challenge at that point, regardless of what anyone else thinks about it. They can hate it or love it. I don't care. It's more like, what can I get from it? How do I how do I push myself into something I hadn't done before, rather than uh, just regurgitating the same thing? Right. And I it think seems like from a compositional standpoint, um, you know, even just taking it out of the page mechanics of the very complex pages, uh, but just down to like a pure horizontal composition standpoint, you've got so many different things open to you. You know, you see the same thing in film when Cinemascope. Oh. And uh, there was this push as soon as televisions came in to have the much, much narrower formats. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it, it, it's uh, I am surprised that you have resisted so far having your your uh, Lawrence of Arabia shot with the camels, <laughs> uh, you know, being little ants on the horizon uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> across across the entire spread. The, the toughest issue was uh, in terms of like what that format can do was the issue five when we decided to do the split narrative right um, mm -hmm. it was so funny because like when we when we wrote it we were set out to write it hayden and i both were like i don't know can, can this book is already strange in terms of how how it's set up can this actually work we're literally taking the the horizontal thing and then chopping it in half down the middle <laughs> you know and uh and i was i told hayden you know we wrote it and you know, I said, if it feels like as I'm working, it doesn't work, we'll just start over, right? But, uh, but I'm like, I, I, I think we can work, I think we can make it work. Uh, and it was definitely challenging. Uh, but we ended up writing two different tales that, um, right. in that, that made that possible, I think, to, to yeah. split the narrative in that way. Um, so that again, that sort of like the structure that we we're choosing for that issue informed how we wrote each of those sections, which I love about that is thinking about that ahead of time in the writing process. Uh, but it's funny though, because like, even though that it, it's not that old, uh, I look at that issue. I'm like, I don't know how how I did that. <laughs> you know? It's like what? <laughs> I think one thing yeah. that worked is like in those sequences, you could either read here and here, and then uh -huh. like here and mm -hmm. here, or you could read across and across. So uh -huh. you, you kind of like bulletproofed it a little bit in an interesting way. Yeah. I, I found that pretty interesting. And yeah, and, and, I think the key to it was making sure that no matter what, just through layout and design and color choice that the reader didn't have a choice in the matter in terms of getting confused of what, what was what and when right was, you know, so and and you, i mean that that gap that you've introduced between the the two streams you know i mean you must have just really finessed that like oh how how little can i have I mean, <laughs> right. Yeah. Yes. make it's, sure it's the right color choices yeah yeah right and it's fantastic <laughs> yeah uh yeah it, it, it's interesting because we, we you know carson and i have occasionally done um these things with Brandon where we talk about a certain comics formalism that hasn't been done before and the the uh, split visual split narrative like that where you essentially have separate certain streams we found a few different examples of it but um, I, I think this is yours is the only one where you are actively like that I, that we've encountered that actually actively like invites the reader to essentially like you can choose whether you want to see these two scenes relate to each other which is yeah. its own like separate third story essentially like yeah do you see these like two is this a romance on the top and like a friendship on the bottom or you know like right, or right. or somebody could go through and read the entire first stream read the comic all the way through to the end and then to read the second stream you know um, right yeah it, it, it's a very uh it, not just like a you you know unique thing but also like a unique application of a unique thing you know it's like a very yeah. inventive sequence uh yeah, I think, it, I mean, when, when we first came up with that idea, it was sort of like, we wanted to do the idea, and we toyed with this a little bit as we go into the next arc, you know, uh, the idea of story within story, where you're following different narratives. Um, and we wanted to do something like, well, how do we do a story within a story, but um, maybe try to present it in a way that is unexpected. And mm. instead of just like having all the, the stuff involving hope up front or bookending that sequence right. making it more 
of a dance in a way it was it was an interesting challenge. I mean, one of the things we struggled with in the writing process is how much do we want to want what is happening in each scene to reflect in each story. And we we quickly decided like, well, let's not focus on that so much and just let the narrative be what each narrative needs to be. And if people find any connectivity, that's great, but there's nothing, we didn't set out to actually have any connectivity. It was just more of a fun experiment, you know? Right. As soon as you talk about like couching narratives and narratives, my brain's going <laughs> like, especially like one, one thing that I came away from working with Dave on Strange Death was layering. That's a right, thank you. Like the layering of panels is still something I'm chewing over. And my mind immediately goes to like the, instead of relating things this way, relating them this way on the page yes. would be like, I want to like, oh, I got to go try that now. <laughs> like make a layered story that way. Oh, yeah, that's no, it's super cool. Idea. I tried to dabble a little bit of that in Batman the Black Love where I, I for I'm I'm such a geek in this way. I love stories that have subtext, mm -hmm. meta tech, meta textual content to them where you know, yeah, you have your surface story, but then there might be something going on underneath that is you have to kind of peel it away and peek at it. I love those kinds of stories primarily because I was such an Alan Moore fan, really, and mm -hmm. he's a master at that sort of thing and Neil Gaiman as well. Uh, so when I worked with Grant on Batman the Black Love, we tried to I tried a little bit of that layering in a simplistic way. You probably want to take it way further than what this was, but I could understand that desire to see what is possible by, oh, what happens underneath? Can you look into the page and see another narrative? Um, so when Grant wrote that story, he the opening of the story was you know had these elements about these characters that um were from the you know decades old characters from batman dc history stuff and so i purposefully decided to draw it in that six panel grid that those comics had and it's funny because as i was working i was turning in pages and grant was seeing the pages as i was turning them in as he was writing and so <laughs> he was like Oh, I love that you're doing this retro thing. I love it. Let's make the whole thing that way. And I'm like, no, <laughs> <laughs> like, don't no. box me in. <laughs> and so, but he he like went for it and started doing that sort of thing. And so I started going like, hmm, what do I do with that? How do I make this a commentary about modern comics versus old comics versus at the time I was the only person to have worked with both Grant and Alan Moore who had this whole uh uh, inspiration dynamic between the two of them yeah. going on. Uh, and so uh, he would write these pages and I'm like, okay, he's got the six panel grid thing going on. It's driving me nuts. Uh, it was cool to start off with, but I don't want all of it to be that way. So I figure out ways to tear them up and tear them down as we went through the story. And by the third uh, chapter, I literally had it as it was tearing away, revealing a different structure underneath. Yeah. That was the nine panel grid in Watchmen. Um, oh. so, so it was commenting how comics history relates to uh, modern comics and back and forth that had this weird dynamic going on, uh, which is sort of like the idea what you're talking about, like a narrative deeper underneath the panels. Yeah. Did Grant comment on that? Because they yeah. they had they are kind of famously have had their kerfuffle. Yeah. No, so that's didn't. a kind of funny one to throw in there. <laughs> it was it was more out of my own vanity, really, because it's like, hey, I've worked with both these guys, so here's my little nod to both of them. You know? Yeah, it's that's a funny one. <laughs> I I I'd have to go back. I haven't re I haven't read that one in a while. I'm a, I gotta go look for that now, though. That's hilarious. Yeah, it was also yeah. a way for me to kind of like, oh, what can I, how can I toy with what's in front of me and, and ref, you know, refuse to, refuse to adhere to one structure and, and um, 
what can come of it. And it, it was fun. Cool. Well, cool it's cool. almost like you're feeding him his own medicine there too. Like with what <laughs> he was like, what he was doing by combining the past and the present. You're like, yeah. I understand what you're doing well enough that I'm going to do it in the art without instruction. It sounds like. Yeah. And one of the things that dawned on me to do that is because not only the, 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 the meta commentary of the, the Grant Allen dynamic and my meta commentary of experiencing working with both gentlemen. Um, but also he wrote this one character in there. Um, oh, I can't remember what he's called. He was like this bird costumed character. And when I came up with the, the way that character hit me when I was reading, I'm like, oh, that, this character is like, this character is like something out of Watchmen. And so I drew it like out of Watchmen and that sparked the whole thing in my head even further. I'm like, oh, this, how far can we take the meta commentary thing and telling a, a, a murder mystery tale in a Batman comic? <laughs> yeah. It's pretty good. It's pretty great. I, it, the, 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 perver the perversion of all this really uh, appeals to me greatly. Uh, you know, <laughs> but, uh, I, 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 just, you know, there's something about the playfulness of being willing to sort of take on something and don it and, you know, wear it for a little bit and, you know, see how it works in the new context. That's just really, uh, you know, really wonderful. And, um, you know, one of the things that really, I think is really strong about Echo Lands, like, you know, you guys really obviously love your characters. Oh yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. you know, you, yeah. you, you seem like you're in, enamored of the story. So, I mean, it, it, you guys are writing this together, right? And this is yes. something that you guys are conceptualizing prior to the prior to the script, or yes. what's the actual generation process look like? So it initially started. I had met Hayden at a convention. Um, he at the time was working for Lucas Arts, um, okay. and <clears throat> so I ended up going to dinner with um, with him and a bunch of other Lucas Arts people, and then there was other comics people. Everyone's geeking out on each other. And uh, he and I hit it off. Then a thing came up after that. Some, he loved Promethea at the, uh, and was super excited over that comic. Um, and then we ended up getting an opportunity to work together a little bit on a short story for Hellboy Weird Tales. Okay. Um, and we enjoyed the process a lot. And so at that point, I'm like, hey, you know, we should do something else together. Uh, I've got this, I've got this thing, I've got this idea. Uh, and we started talking about it at that point. At, the po at that time, we didn't know what it was gonna be called. Uh, it was just more of like, hey, I've got these characters that have been living in my head since I was a kid. Here's the basic thing that I'm thinking about of it. Uh, what do you think? And he liked, liked the general idea a lot. And so then, us as a partnership at that point started honing it and making it something that actually would work more than just like oh isn't this cool you know uh and we just kept picking away at it and um we built you know slowly built the bible built the concept of the world uh, a lot of it based on some of the things uh, I had thought of as a kid, like Hope herself was the character, main character from when I was a kid, but there's other little tidbits of things that mm. have creeped in. Uh, some of it has creeped in in ways that are surprising uh, just from a, a natural osmosis effect between he and I as we were working. Um, so like Romulus actually was in, uh, born of a different character called Lazarus that uh, that I had as a kid. It was this armored guy, and he was from uh, uh, like this futuristic Rome that I had, was thinking about. Um, but now it has evolved into this like huge uh, Kirby inspir inspired thing, and he comes from Fourth Rome and is, right. you know, believes himself to be a de you know a demigod and all that kind of stuff. But uh, and that's all from conversations with Hayden. So like the germ of the the thing was here and then our conversations led it to here. Um, and then in terms of the writing process, uh, we started building the, the main arc. Like we, we knew where we we're going from here to, the, to where we're going to end up. That journey, the journey of that has evolved and there's more to it now. Um, uh, 
some of it was invented after we wrote issue one uh, to to expand on some 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 things that and it's better for it. But um, uh, so yeah, we developed the whole arc, started pitching it around. People wanted to take it on, uh, uh, but then uh, and this was during Batwoman, so. Uh, we had knew we wanted to do this this book before the Batwoman job, but then the Batwoman thing fell into my lap, and uh, and I'm like, hey, let's do this together. We've been working together. Let's do Batwoman together, and it was great. It was perfect because it, it allowed us to. We had been creating all these ideas, but hadn't actually written scripts together, right? right? And so this gave us the opportunity to write scripts together and see how each of us think in fun, in terms of function of you know breaking it down to every little aspect a page does. So that was a great learning curve. I, I think Echolands would not have been what it is now if we hadn't done Batwoman first. Mm -hmm. And then while on Batwoman, towards the tail end of that, uh, get the the job for Sandman. So the plan was for to leave Batwoman and go over to Echo Lands already had the deal in place with Image Comics, mm. but then Sandman came and there and everyone like Hayden and Image were like, no, you have to go do that, yeah. you know. And that ended up becoming years just to do the you know the Sandman thing, uh, and then so now when we write Echo Lands, one of the fascinating things to me is in terms of process between he and I is the way we trade drafts is still very similar to what we do with that woman but sometimes we talk about things before a draft comes or right. a partial draft is written and then we'll get on the phone we'll chit chat about it and then the next person takes over from there and then it comes back to the other person and they do more things to it so it's like this real given and, give and take situation with creating a draft a final draft and we we tend to go through probably five drafts per issue before we were it's like, okay, this is ready to draw. Um, okay. And even though Echo Lands very much is a visual candy store, uh, uh, the writing the, the writing process is extremely integral in such a way that I, 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 I need to have a full script. I have to draw from a full script, even if I'm writing it myself. Mm. Um, and uh, as and so, like, you know, the whole thing of Hayden and I working back and forth is so important about making sure the thing functions on paper first. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then when I go to tackle the art, I then have to sort of divorce myself from it a little bit and start treating it the same way I would a script from anybody. And so uh, I sometimes will make um, changes as I go uh in the art process it's like you know the way something is functioning the way it's on the uh, written on the page might not be working out so well with the landscape format as an example and i have to make adjustments or, or little things like that but yeah our, our, it's fascinating i love the the collaborative aspect that hayden and i have and um uh and it's led to some interesting things so like when we wrote Issue one of Echo Lands, um, we knew where the second issue was going to pick up from. But then I started thinking about, like, well, the way the first issue of Echo Lands ends, our original idea was for Hope, Core, and Rabbit to be that's it. There was not going to be anybody else. Um, mm -hmm. We knew we were going to touch on these other things like Horror Hill, but not in the way they have become. But when I when we got to the end of the first issue, I started thinking about no, you know what? There needs to be more people to live here <laughs> for this group. It's too convenient that the main characters are the only ones that we want, are the only ones that survive. <laughs> and so when I started working on the second draft uh, of the uh, the first draft of the second issue, I'm like, oh, we should, you know, let's have this and that in there. And Hayden was all for it. And so that collaborative aspect, even though we had the structure, of, like we knew exactly what we wanted to do, we kept ourselves open to kind of like, oh, that's a really great, cool idea. Let's see what we can do with that. And we kind of bounce it off each other back and forth in that way. Yeah. We were even doing it today. We, were, we had a writing meeting today and I'm like, 
I mean, literally as we go, we're like doing things we didn't anticipate doing because it's telling us it needs it. And so it spawns uh, interesting conversations to where this thing that we're going to do this, that we decided to do with this one character, we're like, okay, well, where does that end up? Where is that going to take us with that character? And we started talking about it today. I'm like, oh, it could be this, it could be this, it could be this, you know, <laughs> it's super fun. What is, is it, it about the full? Go ahead, go ahead, Chris. Uh, I, I was going to ask, what is it about the full script that, that it surprised me to hear you say that I need a full script? Because I, you're, what shows up on the page looks like there's no way you could script for that. So it's strange <laughs> to me to think like panel one is an amorphous blobby shape about uh -huh. this big, you know, like what is yeah. it about the full script that that is like that you need it? What causes that or what does it give you? Um, I, I guess it, it makes me feel comfortable having that roadmap. So if I know if I know that essentially it functions in the script form, even if there's some deviations along the way in the art, it's already rooted on something that did function. Mm -hmm. And so it's going to, it's going to be all tethered. It's all going to stay tied together more. Like when I worked on, one of the things that kind of made me really start to push for that is so like when I worked on Chase, was co-writing Chase, we were had full scripts and all that stuff. But then when I went over to Promethea, I got full scripts at first, but then uh, Alan with the uh, menagerie that ABC Comics was, he quickly was not able to keep up, like here's a whole script. So we were getting piecemeal scripts uh, from that. And as a, as a person who thinks in the design sense and is very uh, concerned about, well, here's what's happening on page one. How does that relate to the last page? You know, I couldn't function in that way on Promethea. So I had to kind of, fake my way through that and, and mm. make it make sense as I went. So after that, I was like, no, I really got to have a whole script um, just so I can make, feel like I can plan better. And that ended up becoming important. Like when I did Salmon Overture, uh, at first Neil wanted to do, you know, here's a little tidbit of that and to bit of that. Cause I guess some Salmon was written that way before. And I'm like, nope. <laughs> You know, I, I need to see how the last page ends so I can see how it affects what I'm going to decide on the first page. And then when we were writing Batwoman, that as an artist became very important to me. Uh, so, and it also, the other thing I like about it, it allows us to think about um, functionality structure. Mm -hmm. So like with Batwoman, one of, we came up with a hard set of rules for certain things. So we knew every issue of Batwoman had to start with three panels and end with three panels, no matter mm -hmm. what. Um, and so having those things in mind in, in, for the drawing from a full script, it's, like, it's almost like the design process is beginning there with, in the scripting. So, but still giving myself the freedom to change the design ideas that might be present in the script as I draw because it's telling me it needs to be something else regardless of what that script said. Um, and uh, it's just a much more comfortable space for me. Um, and also the other thing I like about it, it, being most of my career being an artist, uh, drawing from other people's, people's scripts, the thing about the comics industry, it's so easy for each person's role to be cemented Mm -hmm. This is what this guy does. You know, Brian Hitch, he is an artist. That's what, that's he, that's what he does. Or, you know, Arthur Adams or any, you know, other artists, that's what he does. And then you have your writers like, you know, Matt Fraction or Grant Morrison or Neil Gaiman. That's what they do. And it's like all these cemented places for everybody. And I didn't want to be that because I think going back to the beginnings of our conversation about when I was a kid, I was thinking about story and narrative and wanting to be a storyteller. And I felt like, yeah, I wanted to be a comic book artist, but more than anything, I want to tell stories, right? Yeah. And so writing, working from a full script that even though I am the writer, it's practice for me to, to be, to write those full scripts to, uh, in terms of craftsmanship as being a writer, even though I'm going to draw it. Um, I don't know. It's just like something I 
creatively, it's an interesting challenge and it's a different hat to put on, you know? And it seems like you're able to engage your design sense 100%, uh, knowing that the foundation is laid by the other stage. Yes. Um, and, and, and I was gonna, the, the thing I was gonna ask, uh, you know, back at the start was how does it feel to be the person who is making the thing now? I mean, I, I, I have to, I have to guess that this is a first time that you've been in like a full ownership situation of something yeah. that you're, uh, I mean, that, I, I presume that that's a positive. For oh you. yeah. Yeah. It's definitely positive. It's stressful as hell. <laughs> 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 Lots of pressure. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, it's, it's something I've always been trying to work toward. In some ways I feel like in my career, um, it's something I feel like I should have did sooner. Um, nothing against the projects I've been on yeah. because I've worked on some amazing projects and learned a lot from them. So it's like that kind of like that weird double-edged sword thing where like, oh, I should have been doing this much sooner. But look at all the things I learned from working with these right. people. And I can apply that to how I structure a script and the craftsmanship involved in the scripting, whether people can engage with what, what we're writing or, or not. It's the craftsmanship involved and the thought processes involved and the thinking involved. I learned so much from working with these people. Um, and I, I remember working on Battle when we were writing for a, an arc that someone else had to draw. I remember like someone was like, this is wordy because <laughs> we put a lot of stuff into the script. And I'm like, <laughs> I was like, try Alan Moore. <laughs> try Dave Sim. I got, <laughs> you get like 16 page biblical exegesis for like <laughs> one panel, one page. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And it's, that's, and it's uh, I'm not like that, that crazy about it, but <laughs> I try to write scripts that, just for my own personal benefit as being a writer then translating as an artist to like everything's there it's all been thought out there's no guesswork involved does that going to take words of description sure you know yeah. and so it's funny because like and it surprised people like when i when we took on batwoman like from edit, the editorial side they're so kind of surprised that the scripts weren't like character jumps out a window next you know yeah. they were, we were like no this is why they're jumping out the window this is you know what the sky is like outside and all these kinds of things and thinking about the atmosphere and trying to uh <laughs> convey the narrative really you know those things that matter to the narrative not just just the action because the way <laughs> it looks and what's in the environment matters to the narrative yeah. in some way right so yeah. i try to get all that stuff in there even if i'm drawing it <laughs> so that's that's really interesting to me because I would not have guessed that. But I, you did kind of set up my next question, which I, I would be curious because I mean you worked with kind of like the big four from from an era at least with mm -hmm. dealing with Alan Moore, Warren Ellis, Neil Gaiman, and Grant Morrison. Mm -hmm. I mean that's that's like a kind of Mount Rushmore of writers for yeah, 80s right? and 90s. Like so, what were those lessons that like or a couple big ones that you took away from that? Um, I probably say not to knock um, uh, Warren Grant or Neil at all because they came after my work with Alan. Mm -hmm. Right. I learned the most from Alan because yeah. I mean, you end up working with writers like Alan Moore for six years or so. It's gonna it's gonna entrench on you in such a way that uh, it will it will color how you operate. Every, on anything that can comes after yeah so i learned my the biggest lessons from uh from alan in terms of like wow this is how this is how you write a script this is this is i know there's some artists that were frustrated with the detail alan would put in but i found it all extremely helpful hmm. it was very and, and you know the trick to you know working with alan is deciding what to use and not to use really mm -hmm. but i like that i have all these he's giving me all the tools laid out you know um uh so all those things i learned there in terms of how i would approach a scene 
I learned from doing my explorations with Alan. And then that just sort of gave me the confidence for everyone that came after to kind of go like, to be willing to go, no, this is how I see it. This is what I want to do here. Um, so as an example, uh, on uh, Sandman Overture, um, the scripts would come in from Neil and there was no double page spreads. I turned them into double page spreads, <laughs> you know, because of the things I learned, the tricks I learned and the different ways to attack, attack a scene that I learned from working with, uh, with Alan uh, comes into play. Uh, mm. And he's all for that. And it was great because Neil, so one of the things I learned with, with Neil is, um, is the humility he would have in the process. You know, uh, let's face it, Neil is as big of a, a name writer uh, and warranted so as Alan in the comics industry. Uh, but well, there bigger was no outside. Sense, yeah, yeah. And, there, there, and there's no sense of ego when talking to him as, another, as a collaborator. So it was, and that was the one thing I was a little nervous about because I, I really didn't know Neil at the time when we started working. And, you know, I remember having conversations with him early on. I'm like, hey, you know, I see it this way. I want to do this way. And I he would send me scripts and I would put, <laughs> this, is, this is kind of funny. So I don't do thumbnails. And that was something uh, editorial, Vertigo editorial was like, wait, what? You don't, you don't do thumbnails? And, and I'm like, yeah, and I don't do pencils either. And they're like, what? <laughs> you know? And so the editor, uh, Shelly, she had to kind of like uh, find a, a new comfort zone for that because she wasn't used to working with anyone who was that way. And they, of course, you know, why, 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 Jim, why don't you do these things? And I was like, because I need to have the, the space to, uh, if it's all of a sudden telling me to do something different, I need to be able to do that thing instead of asking for permission to do that thing. Right. And so when I would get the scripts from Neil, it's what I did for them instead of doing thumbnails, I would go through the script and put in my notes. I'm like, oh, I see this thing this way. Oh, these two pages, these are going to now be a spread and those kinds of things and put in those ideas. And it was so great because when I talked to Neil, I'm like, how do you feel about all that? And he's like, he's like, you know, he came to you, you know, we want you to do your thing. Right. So there were, there was no sense of like, no tug of war really about it. It's more like playing a game, <laughs> you know? I, I want to go back to that. You don't do pencils. You just go no. straight to ink. Yeah. It's just, what I do is uh, there's structure that I put down in, in non-photo blue. So it's like chicken scratch okay. in non-photo blue, figuring out what the function of the page is going to be that way uh then the next thing i do i if there's a, a elaborate design layout to it i'll ink in all the borders um sometimes i'll ink in all the borders before i do any chicken scratch construction and i'll do all that and then i'll go okay well this is what's happening in this shot and this was happening in this shot and then chicken scratch it out and then i go straight to inks from that point so there uh, is some kind of underlying you're not just picking up a pen and drawing a face without Correct. any kind of oh i was Correct. like what in the <laughs> you're, you're already intimidating and then like <laughs> i'm just gonna have to throw you off a cliff <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah it's, it's like it's um i start i don't know why i started doing that i think maybe because it just takes me so long to do stuff so i, I started going like i'm not gonna pencil this because i i would get i, I think maybe some of the things when i was working with inkers uh before i started inking my own stuff i would pen, pencil everything would be in the pencils and i'm like okay i'm just gonna i'm gonna be drawing this thing twice why am i doing this yeah. and so i i kind of taught myself really quickly to just like bare bones like you know this figure's here this figure's here um one of the weird things i sometimes do uh i in the inking stage sometimes i will i'll have a rough idea of what is in the background but i won't place in any details for background and i'll finish the figures and then i'll go in and like okay this is the environment they're in <laughs> you know stuff like that um and i don't do thumbnails because of the, it's a weird quirk i have 
that whatever I used to do thumbnails a long time ago, and but I found myself getting frustrated where okay, this is how this is working as a thumbnail, but then when I would try to apply it to the page, now it doesn't work anymore and working the way I see it working here. And I would get so frustrated with that aspect and I would feel like I'm fighting it when the art is telling me, no, dude, it's supposed to be this. This is why it's not working now. Listen to that. And so I stopped doing the thumbnails because of that and just kind of make it more of a, a, a spontaneous ex, a, a experience. And so even, and this kind of goes back to the scripting thing. So when we're writing full scripts and we're saying, oh, there's gonna be 10 panels here. This is what the design sense is gonna be and all that kind of stuff. So some of the times when I change things is because whatever I wrote, it doesn't feel right anymore. And so you know, I go, oh no, this, the design is gonna be this now because this will work better um, and give myself that, that breathing room. Um, yeah, and it's weird. <laughs> it, 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 there's an analog to, uh, I think, uh, some artists uh, in the music realm who, uh, you know, refer to it maybe as demo-itis. You have people who end up chasing a demo. They did a home demo or something that they, you know, got to a certain level of polish that was satisfying to them. And yeah. Speaking to the song, and then they go to try to recreate that. And for whatever reason, they're missing the mark. And you have people who, you know, have long careers where they just basically either said, I'm never going to demo a song. You're never going to hear it until I'm actually recording it. Somebody like Richard Thompson who gets obsessed with doing a performance and you better be ready because he's going to do a performance when he steps into the studio. Or you get somebody who decides like, oh, my demo is going to be the recording. And you you know, yeah, this is the only way because you're right. Like if you have the technical facility to do the thing that you can do, like why do an intermediate step? Uh, yeah, it's going to involve you bringing it to a certain level of polish that is yeah. unnecessary, right? That's yeah. a, a, it's incredible to me, but uh, I, you know, that's that's really the, yeah. I think the pitfall of my process, though, I wouldn't say it's a pitfall. It's sort of like a give and take situation. But there's times where I'm like, okay, this is what my this is what my gut's telling me to do. I'm going to do this here, and then I'll think of a better idea after I've done it, and then I'll be like, uh with the thumbnail process maybe helped me have gotten to this better idea probably <laughs> but but i didn't so i just yeah. have to remember this idea and maybe i can use it later <laughs> you know, yeah. kind of thing. And, but uh, it's sort of like that tightrope walking aspect of uh trying to be creative by your gut what feels right at the time and that kind of even goes back to what we were talking about about what styles to choose for something it's like it's all like this gut feeling, like what is what is this telling me, um, and trust in that instead of uh, overanalyzing what what is happening. You know, yeah. With, with the style play, I'm curious because most of the people we talk to in ourselves is books everywhere. You got music everywhere, and your yeah, Instagram our books is, are upstairs. <laughs> and and in the issues, you put lists of music, and on your Instagram, you're always showing what records you're listening to. So I was also very curious. If there's, if there is at all, and if there is, if you could go into it, the influence that music has on the art in general, but especially on this idea of style, because when I'm looking at your music, you're um, jumping a lot of music styles as well. Yeah. I'm, I'm just curious about that relationship. I've, I, I've thought about this a few times over the last few years, um, a bit in terms of how music relates to some of my thinking process or at least what I gravitated to. I don't know how much of an effect it had on my thinking process, but why I might like some things versus other things. So music for me was a big part of my life because my dad was super into music. So I learned, that's where my love of music really came from. He had a eclectic tastes, uh, had his preferences, of course, um, so I was exposed to lots of different kinds of music, much like I was exposed to different kinds of comics when I was growing up. So that always had a big impact on me. Uh, the weird thing about when I'm listening to music as I'm working, it, I'm not choosing music based on how I want it to affect me as I'm affect the drawing. It's more or less like, mm -hmm. oh, I just want to listen to that. It kind of keeps me going through the day. Uh, but in terms of music that I feel like 
oh, I see that connection now. Um, I'm a huge Blondie fan. Um, mm. And Blondie is in their first, like their first six, their biggest albums, their first six albums, they've, they've got much more than that. But as they started to evolve as a band, they started evolving into exploring different styles of music all mm-hmm. on one record. Right. Um, and I never really thought about that until more, you know, more recent years of like, oh, that, that's interesting. I gravitated to some of my favorite albums by them or the ones where they were the most diverse in sound. Right. And so it's like, there's definitely a correlation between appreciating that and, 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 being so enamored with all these various uh, styles of art um, and styles of comics, those things definitely correlate. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. You would think that the music I listen to would have more of an impact on me when I'm working than it does. Probably when I was younger, it had more of an impact, especially when I was, you know, younger and you're thinking like oh these crazy visuals and stuff there were certain types of sounds uh that i would get lost in and like think of these grandiose things but when it came down to the structure of creating comics it ended up not having an influence on me um in that way yeah it's interesting that that you mentioned sorry oh no no i was just saying it's fun you know it's more about and my uh ridiculous posting about it my ridiculous lists i i get ridiculous about it because like oh it's there's this this album and it's in this color and it's like you know this kind of stuff because one of the what inspired me to do it was one it was fun and i learned how fun it was to post about that sort of thing because like when we were working on sam and overture uh shelly bond was a big music uh, fan too and she was always very curious like what I would be listening to when working and when, when they decided to do uh, special editions of Overture in between each regular issue, she's like, hey, post your music on here. And I'm like, oh, okay, all right, I'll do that. Mm-hmm. And then that ca- and then when it came time to design Echo Lands, we were like, oh, should we do that again? And my wife was like, oh yeah, you gotta totally do that. And, and uh, and it's weird because it's ended up being a super popular feature. And mm-hmm. so like when the issues start rolling out, I, at first I'm like, oh, whatever. Uh, I, I was kind of like, is it a bit much or whatever? But it'll be, at least it's fun for me. I can share something that I, I care about. Uh, the idea of the vinyl record and the color it is, it's almost like an artifact and it's like, putting on a record is almost ritualistic. So it's almost like this experience of creating a magic space uh, and all that stuff. So it appealed to me in that way. But I thought for sure, you know, people wouldn't care that much, but the letters that we got is like, is, I started getting letters where like, I got to talk to you about this album, <laughs> you know, and all this stuff, it became really like a super popular feature. And I was surprised. And my wife was like, I'm not surprised, <laughs> you know, and, and other people, I've asked other people, like my, my, uh, my friend, Sky, I, I've asked him about it. And he's like, of course, people like that, because uh, it gives them a window a little bit into who you are, right? not just what you're doing, you know? Right. Um, so in that regard, I, I know they get a bit much because I, I talk about, you know, I list them as if they're artifacts, <laughs> you know, it's a little ridiculous, <laughs> but it's fun. It's something different if you know it's i don't know why not <laughs> I, I was i was the the blondie thing was the like that's kind of what i was curious about um if there was like some touchstone for you about the the benefits of eclectic because i i've had a similar thing where i i think it was promethea and then uh mike Patton, the music like faith no more mr bungle Oh, yeah, kind of yeah. a famously ridiculously eclectic all over the yeah. place those were the yeah. two lessons for me in my early 20s about like your style or the thing that makes you recognizably you could be the eclectic mm-hmm, thing mm-hmm. and so I, it was interesting to hear a different touchstone point for you but a kind of a similar response to it yeah um, yeah yeah that's I just, cool I, lo- I love that. I don't know what it is about my personality that uh just gravitates to that eclecticness and um 
maybe maybe even before the music thing became uh, something that I, I gravitated to, maybe it was the fact that I was exposed to so many different types of comics as a kid. And when you're that young, you're just like a sponge, you know? And mm -hmm. uh, I was just like, give it to me all. I want it all. And instead of, instead of boxing myself in and like only focusing on one thing, uh, I ended up, and that ended up applying to all kinds of things, like the type of films I like, the music, the, you know, art, comics, I'm all over the place. I probably like too many things, you know? Um, uh, and then what happens with me, I can't help but like, oh, this thing I love, oh, wow, this could be cool. It somehow inspires this, this thing I'm doing, this creation I'm doing. So it's almost like a reflection of the things I love. And Echo Lands, it's funny that Echo Lands became what it is because it's so much like a love letter to all the things that we adore. Um, uh, it's probably completely for vain, you know, it's got a lot of vainness, vanity to it in that regard. But I'm kind of feeling like, well, the age I'm at, who cares? It's like, show, show the world like the things that you love. Let them, you know, don't be afraid to embrace that, you know, especially... You see a lot of stuff on Twitter. I ended up putting a comment on Twitter recently. It was talking about there's this whole culture that's developed about like how much, oh, here's this cool new thing. How much can we tear it down? You know, rather than yeah. just looking for what is neat and fun about it. Like people have forgotten how to, uh, not everybody. I don't want to sound like I'm overgeneralizing, yeah. but there's, there's a cachet of people that like they've forgotten how to enjoy things. Just let it be what it's going to be. And uh, and, and and just go for the ride. And I, that's one thing I think I'm trying to do with Echo Lands, even though we're doing a lot of experimentation, wanting you to think about what we're, what you're seeing, how it's presented. But ultimately, I just want it to be fun. I want yeah. this fun ride. I, I think that that general attitude doesn't seem as prevalent as it used to be in ter in terms of comics. You know, everyone. I don't know. I just, just let, let it be fun if, and by the end hopefully we've said something you know so. you, you know um carson and i had a uh, we're fortunate to have a conversation with uh, dave mckean uh, uh about a month ago uh, nice. on you know the topic of ai and we really all three of us managed to scare each other uh pretty heavily in terms of <laughs> the uh, long long-term consequences of uh you know image generation through text prompt uh, and uh, I think the thing that all three of us ended up coming away from the conversation with uh, to different degrees and different amounts was that there is something intrinsically positive about a certain kind of artistic self-gratification that like mm -hmm. accepting that you making stuff something for the joy of making it has an inherent value to yourself and likely yeah. is going to reflect that value to other people who, you know, are sympathetic uh, to it. And uh, I, I think that, you know, that might be a real key to sort of maintaining personal relevance uh, in a world that seeks to tell you that you impersonally are irrelevant, you know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's sort of like, what, what is that term? Extreme self-care. <laughs> it's like, sure. I think that's an actual term. So it's almost like, it's almost like trying to do that, but on a creative level with your career and, uh, and um, see, see where that takes you. Uh, Cause I, you know, part of, I think part of my mentality about that is I've been down the corporate road. I've done, you know, done, granted I've been able to kind of weave in and out of that. Um, but I kind of like, I don't know. It's like, a lot of the comics I loved as a kid, granted I read the Marvel and DC stuff, but the comics that I was excited the most as a kid besides something like Micronauts. But see, Micronauts, when I read that, it didn't seem like, it, oh, here's a Marvel comic. Yeah, it felt right. like a creator own comic. It was so original. So the things I loved the most was the, the stuff that was being, that was purely creator driven um, in their own wild concepts. that had nothing to do with Batman or Superman or or Spider-Man or whatever, it's like these other things. As much as I love those characters, there's something that excites my brain. Like when Jim Sterling first put out Dreadstar, right. it's a prime example, you know? Um, or Matt Wagner with Grendel. Uh, mm, yeah. Here's these guys, and they're just like, 
doing their own thing. And there's something joyful about that. And, you know, we live in a time where corporate comics are huge and corporate characters are huge, particularly because of outside media uh, and things like that. But we also live in a time where, you know, all those things I loved as a kid in terms of the idea of creating your own stories, there's so much more possibility and things existing now for that. And I just want to live in that space as much as I can. And I think that your, you know, your project is communicating that joy that you are taking in it, you know, that you guys are, that you guys are having and creating it. And one of the most wonderful things about it, you know, is the dedication you guys obviously have to it. And uh, I think you're hitting on something important too, when you talked about the sort of, it is a learned phenomenon to be hypercritical about something through, you know, a social lens. You yeah. know, we have, people have sort of trained themselves to be critical about something. And, and, you know, you have to sort of retrain yourself to be a sympathetic reader who looks uh, for the the things that are giving you joy in them. And, and, and you know, I'm not saying that, like, turn off your critical faculties when you're of enjoying course. your art. Um, obviously, all three... Three of us are probably, you know, uh, you know, are thinking, oh, thinking about my wife would right? tell you I drive her nuts because <laughs> when I'm in the process of working, I'm, I, I'm the most disgruntled creator. I'm just like, <laughs> I get so stressed out and like frustrated with what I'm doing, you know. But the 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 idea of the creation part, you know, that's where I'm like, yeah, this is so cool. This is fun. The comic needs to feel fun. But yeah, the whole critical analytical thinking part does creep itself in there, you know. Yeah, which, well, which it, might be part of why you you segmented your job so well for yourself, right? Because you're you're able to hand those those tasks off to the to the other person down the line. Yeah. Uh, well, and that critical ability is what lets you go, like the way that you broke down the Kirby, and then the fact that you're doing okay, like I'm breaking down Moebius, and I'm breaking yeah. down I'm breaking down. Moebius and I'm breaking down Jean Girard like you know you do both yeah. and then like uh, Milt Kniff and yeah. Alex Raymond and Dave Matsukelli and I mean all of these things that I see show up like you're having to do a deep analysis of each one of those so that that faculty has to be kind of pumping at all times I would imagine yeah probably it's almost probably uh obsessively so <laughs> you know there might be a, a a mental health issue going on there you know because it, it can become cons pretty consuming uh and i've tried to be i used to be much worse than i am now about it but um or yeah i used to, my wife used to like turn it off <laughs> you know uh yeah. violently so because i would just be constantly like going and going and going i try to do that less now uh uh I think maybe that's a little bit why I've started like when I was talking about being a little bit more instinctual about my choices, because now I'm, I've been around long enough, been exposed to enough things to where I can kind of like, like those, let those things percolate in there and they'll present themselves when it's appropriate, I guess, if yeah. that makes sense. Right. Yeah. yeah. I, so, I, the, the analytical part in terms of what, where I get frustrated and stressed about my work is in the doing, uh, cause I'm, yeah. so like with Kirby or, with the horror hill stuff i'm i'm constantly looking i grind myself down a lot i'm really bad about mm -hmm. this but i grind myself down a lot because i'm like ah, that doesn't look right i hope i can do it better next time mm -hmm. uh and i'm constantly trying to look how to evolve those things and i'm probably well i know i'm pretty hard on myself about it and um uh Thank God I have my wife Wendy because she keeps me grounded and she's like, just you know, you're doing good. Don't, don't, yeah, you know, don't. If she was around, I probably would have destroyed myself in in terms of the obsessive aspects of trying to perfect the craft, you know. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it seems to me that your your previsualization is like, I mean, you know, you've got to be a superhuman of some type in terms of the <laughs> the level that you've you developed this. I mean, I think that that makes it a, a kind of anxious there's an anxiety that comes with that kind of perception. I mean, yeah. I, it, 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 I feel like I understand your ability a little bit more having gotten to ask you about it. But I mean, if I can just ask you, you've been looking at my face now for like yeah. two hours, however long we're talking. I mean, it, do you feel like you have a pretty good sense of the planes 
of my face, like if I, I were to so. turn. Okay, and and yeah. and so if you were you had to represent somebody that looked like me in a comic, and you were able to do that in a different style, like would you be breaking off planes? Is it like you're distorting them in a certain way? Is it like you're shearing parts off? How does that like mentally work for you? Like, yeah, I don't know. It's not. It's weird because it's not like I. It's not like my brain strips off the layers of your physicality um, mm -hmm. to, oh, well, his bone structure must be this and the muscle structure must be that. That's not what's right. occurring. But yet I understand those things are there. And I, I can, if I was to have to draw those uh -huh. in that way, I probably could extrapolate it rather effectively to like to where right. it, it would be you underneath all that. Right. But because of that, I can, like I could, I could do a, a, an, ex, uh, an approximation of your, your visage in a variety of styles because of my understanding of the basics of your, your yeah. uh, mathematical structure to your face, if that makes right. sense. Yeah. yeah, no, it totally does. And you're not sitting there with like a Jack Kirby book when you're doing the oh, Romulus no. character. Because yeah. like when I, when I do that stuff, one of the reasons that I, I think me and Sean come back to this a lot besides liking style play is we've had a number of conversations about the fact that I have uh, not extreme aphantasia, but I, I have a pretty, I, I can't visualize stuff. Like what you say, think about oh. your mom's face. Like I don't, it's just fog at best. And it, like you said, it moves. And so when I do style play, I've got to have that Moebius thing out and I would have to do more. Like if I do my thing, I can do it. But I would have to sit there and like pencil it out and and do more of that work. So, so, so it's really. Oh sorry, no! So I was gonna say. So it's almost like you you for your process you have to marinate in it. And I have to see it in front of me because I can't see yeah. it in my head, and so I have right. to do more translation and stuff. Right. And right. So and it's really and fascinating to like hear kind of the opposite end of that spectrum. And of course, as an artist. Like, of course, I'm going to be envious of that because who wouldn't want to be like, you know? <laughs> and, 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 and the, you know, my, my pre visualization is limited to certain kinds of uh, like, it's, it's almost like the detail is all sheared off. And so I can rotate a simple form in my head. You know, I can have like carry around like a maniquette or if I move in a certain motion, I can, I could draw the gesture that my body is making. Uh, without yeah. having to reference myself or see it, but okay. but it's it's a, it's like an abbreviated form of it, which I think is the more typical kind of uh, thing, you know, like right. you know even like a great animator, um, you know, Milk Call is sitting down and and drawing, you know, he he's pulling from a lifetime of experience with, you know, drawing from a model and and things like that, and and you know, it, he's going to do a certain amount of referencing in a mirror or whatever. I mean. Yeah. Uh, even uh, I, I guess I guess I'm, I, I try to I, I think it's instructive to ask about the uh, you you seem to be an outer extreme of this particular skill which is like distinct from 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 observational drawing I guess is what I'm saying yeah um, and and so I, I, I'm sorry to keep on pressing on that I just I, no, it, it's very fine. interesting to me to uh, I, I don't even know if it's particularly identified as a separate, I mean, you know, I, there's no language for it, right? Like, what are we well, talking about? And I say pre-visualization because that's the word I happen to make up when I was, you know, the, the first the time. The literature is, it's hyperphantasia. So I have aphantasia and then a hypervisualizer, they call it hyperphantasia. Interesting. So there okay. is like a technical term for it. Yeah. We're going to have to get a neurobiologist on to explain this shit to us someday. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll say, we know this guy. Go get some, some brain scans. Um, anyways, we've been going for like a long time. We really appreciate your time. I do yeah, have one, it, one like lightning round question based on the style <laughs> stuff before we go. If you'll, if you'll, uh, yeah, um, humor me with this, with the style stuff. I'm curious, is there uh, one artist you can identify that you've tried to mimic that you really gone? Like I didn't get it. Or one, one artist that you would be like, I'd never fuck with that guy. <laughs> like i wouldn't uh, try that I'm, I'm just curious uh like who scares you hmm so for i now this this is an honest answer all the styles i i dabble with i tend there are some i tend to gravitate to the most 
more than others. But I, I honestly feel like I'm still learning to capture those. So I kind of feel intimidated by all of them. But the one that probably scares me the most that I've never tried to do, I would love to try to do it, but I know it would be very, it would be years of learning to, to feel like, oh, that's a good approximation. It would probably be someone like McKean, mm -hmm. um, honestly, because and mainly probably because the way his style has evolved over the last, you know, half a decade or so, or maybe last decade, the way he sort of has stripped de stripped away all the the trappings of pro of typical proper ana anatomical structure. Mm -hmm. He sort of stripped that away, but yet it's still kind of there. So it's like he couldn't do what he's doing without knowing those things to begin with, and he's mastered the those a lot of those things in such a way. And the, some of the techniques, I'm just like, I, I don't know how you did that. You said, I'll look at something from him and and then they'll be like, no, this is not digital. This is painted on wood and glass. And you're like, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I thought that was a photograph that you ran through Photoshop. Because it, it's so like, some of the things I swear, some of the techniques were digital and they're not. Uh, there's just like this real... Um, wall of knowledge that i don't i can't see past with someone like that uh yeah well and i think with him he's like you and that there it's not there's not one dave mckean look he's True. all over the place but it's True. all dave mckean I, I, like when we were talking to him i said hey these one of the things that initially struck us about the ai is the ai is doing dave mckean and mm -hmm. why is the ai doing dave mckean and he he was like, yeah, it's doing one, one, one thing that I've period. done. Yeah. Commercial. Yeah, like style, one approach but... that I take. And right. I thought that was really interesting. Yeah. Uh, and, and if, and, and, and just, uh, you know, diving in and seeing like one of his ink drawings that are clearly, you know, like he, he's got these like brush, uh, uh, you know, somebody was selling an original of his recently that I'd never seen before of these two figures dancing stylized, like a 1920s, uh, you know, like cartoon drawn in the flapper era and it's yeah. all done in brush, direct in brush and it's all got this little curly cue flip to the, I mean, yeah, the man is insane. I mean, you guys are, you guys are both, <laughs> you know, obviously yeah. uh, tremendous, you know, gorillas of the, uh, <laughs> you know. I think the other thing that's so uh, and, and, and enrapturing about McKean is the ability he has to see a visual in a way I know I wouldn't consider, uh, you know, the way he would uh, break down a, a scene or whatever, and the way he, the way he would choose what shapes to pull out, what to leave out, what to put in, is so distinct that I, 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 I don't feel like I understand his mode of thinking in his work. I adore it. But I feel like I, I don't know if I could put myself in his same mindset to do to capture the things he the way he captures them, like you're the way yeah. you were describing that just now. It's like he does it in such a way that uh, you know it's hard to quantify anyone else uh, tackling it in the same way. You know. Yeah. Yeah, and the thing I came to with the AI is the only reason the AI can do it is because the AI is abstracting to universals like yes. by by having been tagged on so many things it's learned like the the universal archetype the jungian archetype of it all and so that that dude's tapped into it somehow so all yeah. those weird distortions he's making is he's he's going to some like collective subconscious ideal and how he's doing that is fucking astonishing to me yeah and some of the textures he comes up with are just like in, it's in crazy you know like there's something yeah there's so, some of the things you've been doing lately with some of the painted stuff and i'm like you painted that but it looks like a c like uh this is not a criticism but yeah. i think like oh that's a cgi wood texture molded <laughs> into the shape of fingers and, and a hand <laughs> yeah. but it's not he painted it <laughs> you know yeah. that kind of thing you're like what <laughs> yeah and he makes it look like uh, even though it's strange and and distorted 
it does feel like like there's an ease to understanding the illustration uh you don't feel like you have to like wrap your brain around the what he's showing you you know what i mean right. it's, it makes it so easily uh digestible yeah that, this is another thing he's really good at is making strange imagery immediately digestible you know yeah. I should oh, have guessed we're... because you did what five six issues of Sandman and you didn't attempt to Dave McKean in all of oh, yeah. that. So I should. <laughs> I thought of, I thought about it on the, like the first issue when we have the spread of all the different Sandmans and stuff from different uh, worlds. Uh, I thought about trying to do one, but I was like, no. <laughs> I, was I like, should have known. I should have known. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I mean. What what a pleasure to talk to you and yeah. I mean, oh, been thank fun. you so much for taking the time. Uh, this has been our Dave McKean fan cast and, uh, <laughs> episode episode two and uh, our special guest today. Now, I, I really looking forward to uh, future uh, issues of Echo Lands and um, really looking forward to what you guys do next. And uh, you know, congratulations on an amazing book and congratulations on con convincing a publisher that. Uh, just because it's going to be more expensive to be horizontal doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. Uh, uh, did you know this, Carson? That it's <laughs> did, more you, expensive? did you know this? Uh, because no. because of the direction of the grain, uh, the printer uh, will charge you for the same amount of uh, paper. They will charge you more for a horizontal book than they will for a uh, vertical. I didn't uh, know that. Put I it in the no same fucking direction that. and cut it different. What's the difference? <laughs> it, yeah, I know. It, 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 because the all the all the paper sizes are set up for the standards and and you know the way that they're graded out and everything. And you know you can't you can't bind uh, against the grain. You have to bind with the grain. Oh, okay. So uh, that's wow, why they can't. I did not know that myself. <laughs> It, the production people at Image never said anything. Eric Stevenson was like, "No, you can't, you can't do that." Or here's the problem of trying to do that. He was like, "Cool, let's do it." You know. <laughs> so, I, I'll I'll say two things. I we got Sean a bunch of he got all of his copies at Comic Con, and one one thing because I just have the hardcover, uh -huh. um, but he got the individual issues. One thing I noticed is that they have a stiffer cover than most comics, and I thought yeah, that was yeah, really smart given the horizontal. But also amazing design, yeah. It's super easy to find them in the bins because you just look for the staples at the top. And I was like, Sean, I found a couple issues at Echo Land. You got to check this out. Let's see if we can find you a complete run of this. You did it like it's five easy. minutes. It's so easy to do it because the staples are up and everything else. So you have made like the world's easiest to find comic in a bin. It's genius. <laughs> That's funny. That is, that is, that is hilarious. Um, uh, one of the things I mean, we really didn't even get the chance to talk about, like um, doing the Echo Lance raw cuts, was super fascinating. Did you guys get to see any of those? Yeah, yeah Sean got one. Yeah, yeah, I got a bunch. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, that was that's super fun to do. Um, I was trying to like give people like here's a little peek at like mid direction of something, you know, right. uh, primarily because everything I do. <laughs> I've had people ask me, why do you do it this way? But, <laughs> uh, kind of like, it's the only way my brain can make it work. So like, you know, if something is, if I need something to be painted, I paint it right. on the board along with the ink art and stuff. Um, uh, that was, a, yeah, that was a little process thing that uh, we ran out of time to touch upon. But um, yeah. yeah, but yeah. Uh, well, and the decision funny, to though, do... uh, yeah, I didn't even think about that. Echo Lens would be easy to find a bin. I bet you, though, that some retailers hate me for it because <laughs> it's like it probably bends and does weird stuff in there. <laughs> I, I feel like I knew great. which. I feel like I knew which uh, which retailer uh, was uh, <laughs> giving you guff. <laughs> not gonna not gonna name names in case I'm wrong or right. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, that's the yeah the uh, uncut. If you guys have not seen it, the um, the you guys alternated uh, right. That would come out with the the following issue. Uh, yeah, I mean, the original idea because uh, like when we did uh, something similar with the uh Sandman overture special editions which was a similar idea uh the original thought was to do uh i had this meeting with eric stevenson and some of the other um uh uh like uh, other staff at image that kind of make decisions on how to tackle something or how to 
to do this new project or or whatever and he ended up asking me like hey is there something like unique that we could do with this and i had brought the salmon uh special editions and and he's like then let's do that let's do that with this too and i'm like okay cool and so originally it was going to be you know issue one then the next issue would be the rock next month raw cut the next month issue two and so right. on to stagger it out but as we started working on it uh, uh eric felt like no we're gonna get people really want to see the consecutive like let's get the issues rolling out back to back right. but the, it takes so long to do this work that now we have right. this huge publishing gap so i, I still kind of wish we had done it alternating but it right. ended up being like the Rock Cut of Issue One came out the same day as the regular Issue Two, so it was like right. this weird, staggering effect, and I, I it, it means that we, you know, it's insane how fast we lost time on the book because I was like, self-publishing, it, it's almost like self-publishing. Yeah, me. sure. And it, the amount of time that we lose just on all the logistical stuff is crazy, and then of yeah. course the the next section of the series is one of the, some of the hardest stuff I've ever done. So it's taken more time. So we have this huge publishing gap. And you could have bought yourself six months. Exactly. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's, that's kind of like, uh. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, we, uh, we're not sure if we'll do the raw cuts for the next arc or not. Uh, we'll see. Uh, people seem to like them. They just didn't move very well. Um, right. I think people weren't sure what they were when they were solicited. Right. They didn't understand. We tried to explain it, but uh, yeah. Well, you get uh, 250 characters or whatever to to summarize your your book, right? So right. In the diamond catalog. It's a it's a little bit hard to yeah. get it across sometimes. Yeah, but um, uh, so yeah, it's just one you know one of those things you know we could probably talk about Echolands forever in terms of like. <laughs> The things that we put ourselves through to, to try to do these things, but the, on the creative side, I do appreciate like okay, yeah, this this entire spread is going to be a rocket ship, but then there's all these panels that are laying over the top of it, but the rocket ship is painted, you know. <laughs> yeah, doing that stuff and doing it all together, uh, it's easier for me to do it that way on the board and trying to try and try and stuff trying to do separate pieces. Yeah. Uh, but then the, on a technical level, what I have to do is scan it twice. Yeah. So I have to scan for the, the black and white or the grayscale and then scan it in color. And then then I have to uh, marry the two in layers before handing over to Dave Stewart to do whatever he's going to do. So gotcha. that's that's an interesting technical, tedious technical thing that. You know, right. We can talk about the fun of creating comics all what we want, but there is a side to it, you know, on the technical side that is mind numbing. <laughs> Sean, is there a way to do that all in one scan? If anyone has an answer to that, it would be Sean. Uh, yeah, it depends on how you would. Um, yeah. Uh, but, you know, uh, uh, this would be a conversation that'd be interesting to like three people. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, but like, because Sean, you always have a scan everything in, in high res full color, even if I'll, it's black I'll and wait, white. Yeah. Yeah, and that's because of the yeah. There's there's various reasons for that, but yeah, I always I always start with color uh, because it gives you more flexibility in terms of knocking things out. And uh, you know, wait, this is this is the flaws of uh, starting your pre press uh, career by restoring something that's broken. Uh, <laughs> I did, you know, you 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 you've seen all the different ways that uh you know places can lose uh, uh, original art or things can be damaged or negatives can disappear or negatives can be poorly scanned and then thrown away or they could be never scanned and thrown away and so I end up having this sort of archivist view of everything where everything gets a color scan uh, at 600 pixels per inch with no anything applied other than uh, you know conforming the scanner to a certain color profile and then uh yeah so <laughs> but there might there might be a couple emails back and forth where you could yes, cut out I, a second I, scan uh, totally because sean's I, I, expertise I, is i mean he's the wizard of this stuff so he might be able to save you uh yeah well, i think one of the things i found that i have trouble with when i've scanned in color because i've done experiments with the scanning of course when i've scanned something in color that has to be black and white then become black and white for dave to then color it um right. 
I found that when I translate, when I tried to take what was a color scan and then make it black and white, right. um, or black, white, and gray, whatever it is, I end up with a little bit of a muddiness that bothers me. Um, yeah. And, and so I've taken to, I still do super high res. One of the things I changed start was when I started scanning towards the end of the first arc, I started scanning at uh, full size yeah. and then reducing down to print size. Uh, right. So scanning at super high res, then after I do all my cleanup, um, whatever I have to do, like, oh, that, that, where'd that cat hair come from? <laughs> <laughs> and taking that stuff out. Then I would reduce down the size and drop into the production template for everyone else to do their thing. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, yeah. It, it's interesting. Even something as simple as, uh, you, like you said, converting a color scan to a grayscale scan, uh, you know, the different methods that are being used under the hood to do that vary from program to program. Essentially, you've got like all these default different ways to do it. If you ask your scanner to scan in, in grayscale, uh, it's randomly throwing, I mean, not randomly, but random yeah. per the scanner designer throwing out two of the color channels. So you're essentially getting like a great, you know, you're getting like a blue channel only, you're getting the, the you know, the red channel only or the green channel only. Um, and and uh, and the thing about color, scanning it in color is if you work out the sequence or, or whatever, you get, you get, you know, flexibility to, to turn that in, you know, in a, in a way that's most desirable for you. But yeah, I can see how like, uh, just doing whatever the stock color conversion might not be, you know, it might be something where you convert to profile versus assigning a profile. If you do it in Photoshop and you just go to eight bit from the color, it's automatically going to be muddier because it's assigning it a color profile that's not applicable to the original scan as opposed yeah. to a converting profile anyway this is not interesting to anyone other than two of us <laughs> well it's, but, especially because like you know quite often um a lot of my work lately i use a lot of wash tones and stuff right mm -hmm. so um to capture all that stuff well whether it's grayscale or a grayscale scan or a color scan uh after i scan it i always have to make adjustments in photoshop to try to beef up uh the blacks and stuff and it's like this fine find balance you have to choose mm -hmm. like well if i go too far then this be this you know oh the little blue pencil that it picked up is now showing up and it looks like this muddy edge or or whatever right. oh well if i back it off too much then the black isn't black enough um it's like this weird uh dance i'm always making different decisions on every page it seems like when i'm scanning um uh, yeah, it, yeah. It, it's a tough, it's a tough other hat to wear. And uh, it's, it's an odd, you know, it's an odd situation that us, you know, people are in these days, because, you know, you, you, you want it done right, right. And, and you're yeah. the person who, who made it and you want it to reproduce. On the other hand, it's like, man, a poor artist doesn't have enough hats to wear. <laughs> <laughs> right. right. Yeah. And, and, you know, for me, like, if I'm doing something where, I, you know, oh, here's a section that's fully painted color, but it has to live on the page with this line drawing or this grayscale right. drawing. I do that all on the board and then I, you know, then I have to figure out, okay, well, I'll scan it in multiple ways and piece it out and then marry it back together to hand it over to Dave because those things all need to be separated for Dave to be able to do his thing as easy as possible. Yeah. Know, Cause then it has to go off to a flatter and the, if I, yeah, yeah. So it's interesting. It's been an interesting learning process too for like Dave keeps, you know, so he'll try different things to like, oh, you know, the, the color didn't marry, the painted color didn't marry well. And so it might look a little uh, cut out on occasion. Mm. So we keep trying to different things to make that a little bit more, feel a little bit more seamless. So it just feels like a painted style next to a, a line drawing style. Yeah. Um, and feel a little bit more natural about it uh it's yeah it's interesting or we'll alter the painting sometimes too so right yeah. like we might add a hue a different hue to the painted part to make it feel a little bit more integrated into the rest of the color mm. stuff like that yeah. i think the thing we had the toughest problem with was uh the vampire character like the the black and white yeah. and gray yeah. character like the first couple issues when i got the color back from dave it was driving me nuts because on, on the black and white art, she looks fine, right? 
her her style the tones and all that looks fine but then when i would see it in the color art she felt more like it was too stark of a difference and so first couple issues i actually had to go in and add gray tones on top of her after it was colored and but it was a learning lesson for me i'm like oh i need to put more tone in the original art to try to capture that uh mm. that 1970s horror comic monster movie kind of vibe so and that's one of the things like the new section that's all in horror hill the i'm putting way more layers of tone on there to such an extent now that we don't have to in the color process it doesn't have to be tweaked as much it's all right. thought out you know but it's it's on a technical level it's all these interesting challenges and learning things along the way you know so. Well, and the, there's some baffling decisions when you look at the 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 art in its raw state, like painted spaceship. But then there's like all this black and white ink wash, and he goes in make it look like a painted watercolor. And so why didn't he just paint it in watercolor? Like <laughs> you know. But then the technical time. process. <laughs> how is yeah. he doing that? Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, most of it is is time, really. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I would love to do a full on painted book someday, uh, but the amount of time versus what uh what yeah. honestly we we make for a financial right. living doing this stuff yeah it, it's hard to 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 warrant that sometimes unless for publishers going yeah okay we understand right. we're gonna we we know the level of work and we're going to compensate accordingly yeah uh, right uh uh and also another reason why sometimes we do it is because i will use the rocket ship as a great example the, the way I paint the rocket ship, actually, actually, most of the rocket ship is used, I'm using colored inks mm -hmm. over grayscale washes, and then mm -hmm. I'll add some gu uh, gouache over the top of it. And so sometimes I make a decision, like, I want this rocket to be painted by hand by me on the board, regardless if Dave is going to do something that looks painterly next to it, because no matter what, it will feel slightly different. Yeah. It will yeah. have a different, even if it's subtle, sometimes it will feel different because it was done on the board. So sometimes it's just like a, it's almost like the whole the idea of splitting styles thing. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Into play on some of those creative uh, technical decisions to make. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, if, if you ever want to geek out about these things and uh, you want to save two scans, uh, let me know via email and we can, uh, oh, yeah, we can yeah, go yeah. back and forth and see if we can oh, solve yeah, no, that, uh, super cool. solve yeah, yeah. that for you. Uh, a a uh, calibration is a amazing thing and an underrated, underrated tool Cal calibrating the uh, the inside, the in, you know, input as well as the uh, as well as the screen. Uh, but uh, yeah, um, I, I'm going to collapse because my children uh, woke me up at 4 a.m. Okay. Uh, this morning. Uh, so I, I am reaching a ex my expiration date here. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Because it's, is it 11? Oh my gosh. Yeah. Is We've been going. Yeah. Oh, it's, yeah. It is where you are. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, I was, I yeah, was we, we appreciate it because you've spent, you've spent a good two wow. and a half hours with us, and that's amazing. We really appreciate wow. it. So, I, thank I, you so much. I mean, yeah. we, we could talk to you all day. I mean, you, you know, I, I really uh, just really appreciate you taking the time. And also just, you know, really just I'm losing my, my powers of speech now. It's just real. <laughs> <laughs> but thanks for thanks for the years of inspiration. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. thanks. And, I and the, the fantastic. Part. It was great. Well, thank you very much. OK, uh, this right. is the part where Carson cuts out how I've said uh, thank you like 15 times and Good goodbye. Night. <laughs> no, I'm leaving it in this time. <laughs> All right. Th thanks, guys. Thanks. So thanks much. for watching, everybody. Thanks. Thanks, JH. Make sure to like, smash that subscribe button, and ring that bell. <laughs> <laughs>